Hello and welcome to what will probably be a very strange Rewind Reviews we've just discovered. Um, mm. Both Chris and I operating on very little sleep. Um, mm. I'm also not very well at the moment, which is why I'm not operating on very much sleep. Chris is currently very busy at work, hence his lack of sleep. And uh, between the two things, we are not in a... We, we have quickly discovered we are not in our best form. So but it might, put... it's, if, there's, if there's any movie, Dan... Where arguably we can get away with going, yeah, it's great. Like, don't worry about it. It's good. <laughs> like, yeah, it's probably yeah. this one, isn't it? <laughs> it's a good. It's, it's it's a good movie. Cool. Um, great. Well, we we'll see you guys next week. We're going to talk about uh, <laughs> Return of the Jedi. <laughs> no, I, um, uh, I don't. I'll, I'll kick us off because we. So we did a we did a very long three hour podcast last week about A New Hope, and a lot of that covered Star Wars. So yes, we don't so, want to we don't want to keep you guys for that length of time again. So with this one, we probably won't try and talk too much about our overall kind of Star Wars feelings and history and stuff. No. Um, no. So I'm going to kick us off because what was most interesting for me, because obviously, and, and and also, like, I, I right, I'm going to be bold, Dan. I'm going to be bold. You ready for this? Go on. I'm going to speak for both of us. Okay. You ready? Mm-hmm. We recommend this movie. There you go. Yes. I know it's bold, but I, I can say that with some confidence. Yes. Obviously, we recommend. If you want to hear kind of thoughts on the trilogy as a whole, that'll be discussed next time. And thoughts on the Star Wars as kind of a whole um, and our childhood with it was discussed last time. So I'm going to get right into some analysis because I said, Dan, on the last podcast that I had an issue with this film. You did. You said that yeah. right, right up top. And I watched it this time <laughs> and went, I'm not so bothered by that anymore. But I think my issue was something, even though it didn't hit me this time, it links to a bigger thing, which I think is an obvious, interesting discussion point for this film, which is, so my thing was going to be that I find the initial, I found on my last time watching it, the initial Luke and Han, Luke getting lost and stuck in the in, out in the cold in, on Hoth and Han looking for him to not necessarily then impact the plot in any way. And it felt like there was just this separate beginning piece even more Mm. so than return of the jedi it's funny because watching it this time i was very conscious that i thought that last time and i looked and i'm like it's only like 10 15 minutes like it's fine because it does because i did i did know and appreciate that it it added um a lot of character stuff it let you know instantly where luke and han in particular were where their relationship had grown to um which is very effective um so whilst it doesn't link and could arguably maybe if they could have maybe found a way to link things it it uh i kind of changed my mind on that but it it does bring up and link to the only real complaint i ever hear thrown at at this film which is you know the empire strikes back of star wars is uh well, i say that's a, i'm not losing my mind that's a joke on things always getting referred to as the empire strikes back of dot 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 is the it's not necessarily a complete film that it feels very much like a part two. And a lot of people feel it doesn't have a beginning, a middle and an end. And I think I'd have said that last time I watched it. And after watching it with a more analytical eye this time, I don't know if that's true. I think it, I think it does. And I think you could, I think it does stand on its own. What are your views on this controversial issue, Daniel? Um, Yeah, I think uh, you've hit on some pretty, I think important points for the discussion of this film in general, anytime anyone really wants to talk, talk critically about this film. And that is particularly that, that um, the element of does this film have its own beginning, middle event? Does, does this stand on its own or is this just very good because it's the middle act of a trilogy? Um, mm. I think before I come back to, and I will come back to your point about the opening five minute sequence as well. Um, Cause I, there's some, I some stuff we can cover on that relating to the trivia. Um, and well, that'll be good synergy, Chris. We'll get some trivia out of the way too. Oh, we're on oh, fire. We we're on, on fire. fire. Maybe we this need to be, be this not our best. Maybe we need to be not our best all the time, and we'll be much more efficient with our podcasting. Um, yeah, this will be this will um, be thirty-five minutes long. <laughs> yeah, um, we'll say everything we would normally say in three hours, but we'll do it in about half an hour, <laughs> just with less waffle. Um, 
I think the film does stand on its own with its own sort of middle uh, beginning, middle and end, personally. Um, although I do understand the criticism because it does end on a cliffhanger. But essentially, this is the story of all about how my life got flipped turned upside down. No, I, I can't. I couldn't. I could, oh, Dan, what are you doing? Um, this is the story of Luke learning the truth about himself, bef- but also... <laughs> Finding himself on Vader's path before he even knows that. Before he even knows there's a danger of him going the way of his father. This is the story of Luke learning that he is absolutely susceptible to that. This is a person who gets brasher as he gets a little bit more confident in the world. You know, he's not the farm boy from Tatooine anymore. He's been working with the Rebel Alliance. This is somebody who wants to be training because he's he's got an almost an arrogant streak to him. He wants to be a Jedi. He goes and he finds Yoda. He's grumpy about it. He doesn't want to be there. He's fed up the whole time. He just wants to be a Jedi now, now, now. And he's full of anger. And these are very familiar traits to those of us who know the story of his father. Um, and even, I think, outside of the context of the prequel trilogy, once you know the truth, you can fill in those blanks. And he makes lots of selfish choices to save others. And again, this is echoed in the prequel trilogy, um, you know, with, with Anakin choosing when he gets a premonition to save a loved one, choosing the dark side in order to do that. So you have Luke, a character struggling with himself, this whole movie, and even the audience watching it doesn't necessarily understand how close he really is to turning, you know, how on the line Luke is in terms of good guy, bad guy. And when Yoda basically tells him, you know, you're gonna, you, if you go, you, you, this isn't gonna work out. You, you, you're potentially gonna give in to your, your hatred. You're not trained enough. You, this, this could be your path to the dark side. And Luke chooses it anyway. The arc of the film completes with him then discovering how, like, with him having a choice, making the right one, he continues to fight for his friends and doesn't turn when Darth Vader offers him it. But when you also, that in that moment, discover the truth about his lineage and you realize his father turned, you just, you really do realize how close he came. So I think this movie has a really awesome structure of uh, a character with all this brash arrogance learning how close to the line he really is and maybe how not pure as purely good as he thought he was as he is. Like, you know, he, he had an impression of himself that isn't quite accurate. Um, I think the so audience how, had, an, had an impression of Luke that isn't quite accurate, you know, going play, into this yeah, movie. Yeah, to, to play advocate and and kind of um, dig into that, how do you think the film shows us that then? How do you think the film... Do you think the film does enough to show us how he realises how close he came to the dark side? Or do you think that's that's a reading of it with a lot of external other context, be it the other films, be it, you know, 40 years of talking about it, whatever. Yes. That's a really, that's a a great question. You're right. Because I've got the prequels informing my view of this. Um, I've got, Mm. you know, uh, years of law to inform my view of this. Um, Obviously when I initially watched it, I didn't have prequels as as a reference point. So maybe I didn't see it back then, but yeah, you're right. There's a chance that it is informed by more than that, but I do think it is in the, the text of the film. I don't even necessarily think subtext. So much of this film is dedicated to showing Luke's impatience. So much of this film is dedicated to setting up a scenario where his friends are in danger and Yoda lays out that choice ahead of him. And then so much of this film is then lays out, lays out him coming head to head with Darth and being offered that choice. Join me and we can rule the galaxy together. Side by side, father and son. And Luke still says no. And that's in a world yeah, where we, I, we can see how impatient and how brash he is. You've got to imagine yeah, the th- idea of, of that temptation of, of being able to control things himself. Maybe he could fix the Empire from the inside. You know, you've got to, you've got to believe that, that that would have been a tempting offer for somebody that we've, we've had shown is impatient and... Yeah, I think all the I think the choice stuff is absolutely there, but I guess I guess what I'm saying is is the specific him realizing how close he came because you know the the phrase you used there was you've got to imagine da da da. I think I think it's yeah. partly in there in his no and in his really visceral kind of horror 
of finding out Darth's his father. Obviously, spoilers. Um, whole film. <laughs> um, so I think it's there in that maybe, but that we. I'm not sure how much the temptation to go over to the dark side is in the text itself, in the film itself. Um, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I think I think you're right. I think that the film doesn't like... I guess the film tells the story of a person who does have a... a who is on a fine line. It very clearly lays him as being on a fine line. But I guess the part I'm imparting onto it is that it's a story of Luke learning how close he came. But I guess that you could interpret that as me putting other stuff on it from other movies. Or you could obviously just also look at the fact that, I mean, just quite frankly, the movie lays out his dad went down that path. So he, you know, that no communicates a lot of... Yeah, they are some saying. Yeah. Horror at the idea that his if his dad went down that path, you know, it, to me, it imparts a lot of... Of, of well mixed emotions from Luke including that so in terms of structure I think for me it does stand its own I agree it is heavily informed with the law that's come around it um, but I do think it is even if you take that stuff aside it's still the story of a person realizing that the fight between good and evil isn't as necessarily as black and white as he thought yeah and that and also, is in the like text. it, it... In terms of structure, like it, with the other characters as well, like whilst whilst there is an obvious, excellent cliffhanger of you know Han being put into or Han 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 being put into uh, carbon and frozen, you know Leia Leia and Han go on an arc, <laughs> and you know by the end it, at the start of it it's I can't stand you bickering, and at the end of it it's I love you I know you know that that is an arc that we've that we've seen and gets explored um, throughout mm-hmm. the film. Yeah, I think, and I think that, that looking at the trivia for this and looking at the history of this film, Irvin Kirshner and Lawrence Kasdan had a huge impact on this film's thrust. And while I can see, because it's so character heavy, when the previous film was so plot heavy, I can see how in comparison, it doesn't look like it has a, as clear a thrust but if you look at the characters, it does. If you look at the plot, it feels meandering. Oh, they're on Hoth and they find the Empire and then they're off in space and Luke's getting training and Han and Leia are just tr- trying to stay alive and then they're all at Cloud City and they fight Vader. Like, it's very... Th- there isn't a um, we're going here for a goal sort of plot thrust yeah, like whereas, the previous movie had. <laughs> you know, yeah, whereas was... comparatively with A New Hope, it's like they go here, then they go here, then they go here, then they go here, then they go here. But you're yeah, right, you've, and every you've time just they summed do that, up it's, the film. it's for a reason, though, right? It's like yeah. it's 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 never just oh they happen to be. It's they go here because they want the Death Star plans. They go here because they need to get them back to the rebels. Then they go here because they need to destroy the Death Star. Like every step of that plot, oh they go here because they want to rescue the princess. Like is 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 not just a they go here. It's a they go here because. Whereas this movie is very much. Uh, they they just sort of fall through the plot of this movie. They're, they're not making a lot of choices. Luke makes the choice to go to Dagobah and he makes the choice to come back. But other than that, the characters are just sort of surviving. But I think for the it's, middle act of the trilogy, yeah. that's okay. And I think the way that they get away with it in terms of giving it, you know, structure and arc is through is through character. You know, as you pointed out, Han and Leia have an arc. Luke has an arc. Like, it's, it's you know... He, to a certain degree, even Lando has an arc. You know, it's it's more at the back end of the movie because it doesn't obviously he yeah, doesn't get cause... introduced until midway through. But there's there's a very clear character thrust through this movie, and I think that's how they get away with it, even because though it doesn't I, have I, a plot thrust. I don't feel this way genuinely, but you could. What I said about the beginning about Hoff, Hoff. Hoff apologies if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Can kind of actually be applied to most of the movie, <laughs> like right. Luke, yeah. Luke, Luke, Luke goes for training, but then he ultimately chooses to go back to his friends and rescue his friends. Um, Han and Leia and Chewie and stuff get stuck, get you know, accidentally go down that cave and end up, you know, almost eaten by a beast. But they they get out of it, and and nothing mm-hmm. that happens whilst they are in there, other than the Millennium Falcon wanting repairs 
you know, it, it is impactful on anything. And then right at the end, obviously, it's all the Cloud City stuff. But, so it almost feels like, <laughs> it very much feels in places like an episode of The Mandalorian. <laughs> this is the quest. This is the side capture for, for you know, 30 to 40 minutes. Mm-hmm. Good fun, but uh, almost a side story within a wider thing. But, yeah, like I mean, it does, you, it does definitely go sort of from set piece to set piece, for sure. Yeah, um, but like yeah. you, I think the character stuff saves it. Um, and I think it for the part two of a story, you do make allowances for that. And, you know, they did know they were going right into Return of the Jedi. Um, yeah, that's, that raises... that's the difference, isn't it? It's, I think in, in yeah. a world where this was just a sequel to a moderately successful film and there was no guarantee of a third, then this is a, this is a terrible choice to work. But if, you, if you've made the, one of the most successful movies of all time and you know you're getting to do your trilogy regardless because there's too much financial gain that's to be at stake there for any company to not let that happen then yeah like be get get creative with it if you want as long as the movie feels satisfying by the end and i do i think this has one of the most satisfying endings of any star wars movie um because it is it is famously the downer ending it's the god how do they get out of this imagine that using a whole movie to create a conundrum of fuck how do they get out of this situation the empire don't seem any dampened hands gone Luke just lost his fucking hand. He's found out yeah, his but... dad's a megalomaniac. Like, <laughs> yeah, but the, you see, because I agree with that description, and I can see why it's referred to as that. But every time I've watched this, I've thought the movie itself isn't playing it like that. Like, there's a hero right. shot of Luke with his brand new arm next to Leia and Chewie and stuff, looking out the window, almost smiling with, like, looks of hope on their faces. Yes, And yes. The sort of the yeah, swell yeah, yeah. of the music. <laughs> and I'm like, this isn't... this Like, what you've just described is accurate. But the movie, it's the. I feel like the actual note the movie ends on. Yeah, totally. It's like yeah, almost, almost hopeful. Like, yeah, I guess that might be the family film element of it. Like, you know, like it's you know we're we're still alive. We're still here to fight. You know, this isn't over yet. I guess you know there is a hopeful gleam at the end. You know, they're looking out mm-hmm. from the Re- from the rebel ship, knowing what's knowing that the journey ahead is 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 rough. But you know, feeling. That it's possible, I guess. You're right. It does. It does kind of. The very last shot is a, is a, is more of a hopeful note. Um, but I guess that might just be the the family friendly movie element coming through. Like you know, you don't want to. Yeah. Imagine if they'd ended on Luke getting his hand chopped off and hand being frozen in carbonite and nothing more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's true. That's <laughs> true. Well, Luke, that'd, be more, just... that'd be as bad as um, Infinity War in terms of like kids walking out of the cinema crying. <laughs> Luke just hanging from that antenna. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. No, they don't, they don't even show that. They just show the thing opening up and him falling, and they never actually show him catching the antenna. So you don't know if he just dropped out of the sky. <laughs> I mean, that'd be a bold, great way to finish. But Because what is... What is that about anyway? How did he know that that would happen? How does he get sucked in and then another yeah. thing opens? And, it's a, yeah. it's a, the fan explaining is that he used the force to guide himself to that pipe, but the uh, reality of that situation is it's fucking very unclear in the movie. Yeah, <laughs> um, he should be very dead. Let's in terms of <laughs> well, I, in, to, I wanted to cover the hot stuff if that's okay because it links to some oh, yeah, trivia yeah. very quickly. So. There is a uh, there is a recurring rumor, and we're going to do a little bit of trivia myth busting on this movie. There, I think there's like maybe two or three examples of myth, myth uh, trivia myth busting. The first one is the okay. The story as I understood it growing up, and that was spread around schools, and you know, the sort of thing. Pick kids told each other was that the Wampa scene was added because Mark Hamill had had a car accident a year or two prior to filming this, so just after New Hope while this was essentially starting to be written, and that he'd had plastic surgery to have his face corrected, because it, while it wasn't a serious, in terms of life-threatening car accident, it had heavily damaged his face. That is true. That is accurate uh, description of events. He's talked about it multiple times. It was in the press at the time. Although the press overblew it, said it was like a, you know, a, a near miss. Like, well, I suppose it, oh, any car crash is a near miss. But like, they talked about it like he was in hospital in a coma, basically, the press at the time. When in reality, he was absolutely fine, just some damage to his face. Um, so they did do plastic surgery. And the, the, the story that, that you hear as a young Star Wars fan in the 90s is that they added the Wampa scene to explain that his face looked a bit different in this movie. Because it does. 
Mark Hamill looks significantly different in this movie to it to the to the previous one. There is very little evidence to back that up, other than the timing of the accident. Um, Lucas has said multiple times that the scene was in the earliest version of the script, like a year or two out from filming, and therefore, you know, they couldn't have even known what Mark Hamill would have looked like to even th- try to think of an explanation for why he looked different. Um, so I think I'm going to go ahead and call that one debunked. It's a re- it's a good story, and it does kind of make sense when you go... Because I think that's how a lot of people justify that scene. They go, well, they had to do it because of Mark Campbell's face. <laughs> because obviously they very distinctly get, you know, the Wampa hits Luke in the face and he's clearly got the cuts on his face. I think what probably happened was the scene already existed. And then when Mark looked a little bit different, they said, well, put some cuts on his face while we're here. Because <laughs> he's just been attacked. And if anyone asks, that's why Luke looks different. But I don't think the scene was written for that reason. I think the scene always existed, um, even from early drafts of the script. Um, but it is it is interesting because that's that is a that is a that is a, a Star Wars uh, piece of trivia that's gone on for a very long time. And like I said, it's been it's been I think it's been reasonably well debunked at this point. Um, so and it yeah. is it is like I say I do I did on this watch strongly feel that actually doesn't take up that much time and it probably is especially if you watch as we obviously have done for this if you watch them close together it's a really nice way to introduce where han and luke are in terms of their relationship now yeah it Um, really uh, does shut up set up a very close friendship between the two which is ironic because then they don't see each other again until the beginning of the next movie (laughs) Yeah, but yeah, still. <laughs> but um, and and then yeah. even then they get separated again and don't <laughs> and don't get to spend a lot let's, of the movie together. In terms of in terms of planning ahead, Dan, let's do let's do this. We know we're going to talk about it at some point. So Yoda says there is another, mm-hmm. and they were filmed very close together. Uh, it's hard not to feel like they knew who the other was. So let's talk about the kiss. <laughs> I I actually don't think they did. Do you know? No. It's so vague. And I and also so well, I, we'll get into trivia again. Let me just get like, before we talk about it, let me very quickly cover this piece of trivia because this piece of trivia might give you some context for it. Mm-hmm. So one element of the history of this film that is often overlooked is that the first draft of the script was not written by Lucas or Lawrence Kasdan, but a novelist and screenwriter called Lee Brackett. Now, she wrote the first draft of this film based on a treatment by Lucas and then sadly passed away shortly after it was handed to him. Um, she died of cancer. It's very, very shame. sad. She yeah. Was, yeah, it is a real shame. She's a, she's a, she, she had a really, really incredible career and is utterly forgotten when this movie is talked about. So is, just her, a name, moment. is her name still on the credits? She is still in the credits, Good. but people Good. always talk about this being Lawrence Kasdan and Lucas' script. With Ivan, yeah. with Ivan Kirshner directing. She very rarely gets a look in. Now, the reality is, she handed in a first draft to Lucas, and then he wrote two more drafts following that, and by the time he'd done his drafts, not much of her material remained. Right? But, with that said, oh, and apparently the reason she gets a credit is because legally they didn't actually need to give her a credit. Um, because there wasn't enough of her script left to the, for them to, to meet the, the need for that, like by the writing guild, but they did so anyway at a, as a sort of tribute to her work. The early part oh, wow. of the film. That's um, that's and, and, and that's part of you goes, that's a really nice tribute. Really glad they did that. But actually as, as bad as this sounds, it also potentially, you know, her estate would have made a lot, would have made money as a result of that decision, which is, which is great. That's good. That's nice. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Lucas is very generous with his money on this film. We'll come to that. Um, but basically, re- Lucas rewrote it two more times and then handed it to Kasdan to improve the dialogue because he'd been criticised over his dialogue in the previous movie. And then he and Kasdan sort of worked together polishing up the script at the end. But over the years, the stuff that was contained in Lee's draft has become public. Mm. And it provides a lot of proof that Lucas really didn't know anything. Um, he certainly didn't know that Vader was going to be Luke's father, and he certainly hadn't planned on Leia being related. Um, in the first draft of this screenplay, Anakin Skywalker's ghost talks to Luke a lot, oh. and reve- and reveals he has a sister called Neelith Skywalker. Anakin then explains that he, not Obi-Wan, 
had separated the twins at birth to protect them from Vader, and that Neelith had actually undergone Jedi training in another part of the galaxy so she could join forces with Luke and defeat the Sith. This concept was eventually dropped from the screenplay as the process went on, including the appearance of Anakin Skywalker, and replaced with Obi-Wan and Yoda playing those sort of mental roles to Luke. Um, I'm not sure if Yoda was in her draft or not, but that's how it ended up playing out. Um, So, (laughs) there is another scene in the light of that feels like Lucas going, I still might bring in a sister. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Not necessarily it's Leia, (laughs) but just him going... I'm going to leave this nice and open and I'll see how I feel in a month's time. <laughs> and the whole, the whole, the whole, ooh, of it, when you know, is a shame. Yeah, it's, it's, because, it's uncomfortable. Because, <laughs> because actually, because you can't, you can only feel uncomfortable watching it, which is a shame because yes. every performance in that scene, from Carrie Fisher to Mark Hamill's reaction afterwards to Harrison Ford's reaction as Han, is wonderfully played. It is actually yeah. if you take if you take what comes next out of it, it is a very entertaining scene. <laughs> but no one could look past. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. But I suppose the I suppose the issue with that is, and I guess it comes back to the um, it comes back to the fact that like the characters aren't aware, and she's not really. I think the movie does make it clear, and this is how I sort of don't think it's as bad as maybe it could have been. I think there's a version of this script that makes their relationship more romantic that could have then led to the sister thing being a real problem. But I think the that the way that scene plays out, she kind of does it to make Can jealous. Yeah, even... Not even, out of attraction to Luke. So even Luke's reaction is a... Feels like a put upon smug oh, look what she did look what she did to to, to hand wind than it up. is yes yeah it, Correct. yeah it feels like luke's luke's reacting to get one up on hand way more than he is like you know uh, affectionately into her or anything in that way yeah and and it's it's obvious that the first, i mean the first thing he says about her is she's beautiful <laughs> you know um so it's clear that the original intention was to maybe make that romantic but i guess the way, and this is fan explaining. I don't think the well, I think Return of the Jedi covers this a little when it actually tackles the sister stuff. But the premise, I think, or the way you sort of look back on it, or the way I look back on it now, um, and I think a lot of fans do, is it's two people that felt a connection to each other immediately and didn't understand what it was, and over time mm. discovered it was a sibling. It was, you know, it was. It's almost to me, it's almost a bit like the Harry Potter Hermione Granger relationship, you know. And it comes back to that, you know, several books of 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 sort of. Where it you know it's not a completely ruled out thing, uh, Hermione and Harry. It comes to the point where Ron sort of Harry realizes how Ron thinks about the situation, and Harry turns to Ron and says, "I I thought you all you know she's more, she's a sister to me. I thought you always knew, you know." And it's kind of like the characters discover their relationship as the movies progress, and the relationship Luke and Leia figure out first sort of more metaphorically and then literally is that it's more of a a, a sibling relationship um mm. you know deeply fond of each other yes but not romantic as it may have first seemed or even felt so yeah it's, it is it is icky <laughs> um it's i i don't criticize anyone who watches the movies and goes or shudders at that scene it is it is unfortunate that lucas didn't plan it um I wish he had. It would have been better. I would have preferred not to have the kiss for luck, the she's beautiful, or the kiss in this movie. If I, you know, if I'd have had my way, those scenes would not be present because it does muddy the water a little. Mm. But I do think it's just on the line of getting away with it. Just. Through luck. Sheer luck. (laughs) Because they wouldn't have had to go much further for it to be a big problem. So to ask another controversial question. That sure. again, I don't necessarily feel, but you know, let's 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 sure. discuss. Is there enough Star Warring in this film? Is there enough action? Full stop. Do you think that's one of the other reasons? Because fundamentally, you know, the Return of the Jedi um, builds to a big battle. Star Wars: A New Hope builds to that big battle. 
you know, there's there's certainly some action at the end. But do you think one of the other reasons sometimes people say this is a part two as a criticism is because it doesn't build to a big battle involving a whole planet or a big battle in space in the stars, etc. Um, I, some people could say that, and I don't think they're necessarily wrong. But I think for me, because this one is the more is more interested in character, I'm glad it doesn't have that. I'm mm. glad that what we get are the personal relationships and dynamics. It's it's action in a different sense. It's action in the sense of tension and situational action. So it's 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 not oh lots of guns firing and lots of things exploding. It's action in the sense of they've been betrayed. Han's been frozen in carbonite. Luke's walking into a trap. It's tension-based action and, you know, sort of um, situational. You know, uh, Luke shows up and you know it's a trap and Leia knows it's a trap, but Luke doesn't know it's a trap. And it's like, it's tense. And it's, mm-hmm. you know, and, and let's be honest, that fight between Luke and uh, Vader is awesome. And anyone oh, not brilliant. describing that as action is, is very much missing the point. Because yeah, not yeah and the... Uh- and the lead character gets his hand cut off. <laughs> yeah, I, I, and I, so I don't think it's you're right. Okay, so the criticism, I suppose, at its basis is you know it's called Star Wars. Where's the wars? And you're right. This movie is definitely more personal. But we do get you know Rebels versus Empire on a grander scale in the opening sequences of the movie, and then it focuses down on the characters. And I think for a middle section of a movie, putting the characters somewhere emotionally interesting. And putting them in a tense emotional situation. Like Luke's that fight with Vader is so charged for Luke. It's it's so much is on the line for him, um, personally. And like this you know, and Han and Leia putting their trust in Lando and being betrayed, it's all very personal. And I you know, and you know we talked about the last movie, managing to feel personal even though it was galactic. This movie feels personal because it is personal. <laughs> You know, it, yeah, really, and I think, it gets and, into and the think, characters. And I think that's okay. Uh, yeah, especially knowing that there's a third one coming again, which shouldn't really be an excuse. A movie should stand on its own. But there's enough action in this to make that work, I think. Especially the, the, the lightsaber fight towards the end. And the, the escape itself is reasonably action-packed. Lots of shooting stormtroopers and stuff. Yeah, I know we keep coming back to it, but I think the I think the... The character weight and the emotion is is this film's equivalent of, you know, with New Hope, we were like, there's so much imagination in that film. Yeah. So much imagination, and it just feels rich with it. This film, this film feels rich in the same way with character. And actually, I yeah. think I think Return is a good balance between the two, but obviously we'll get there. But this, you know, if you think about... It's got those action moments, though, obviously, put, put it, turning the, um, you know, putting the wire round... Um, the thingy with jigs legs and having that fall to the ground and stuff. Yeah, the, um, the, you know, I'm not but... ca- uh, the at at I'm not calling it an at at. I know that George Lucas has said it's at at. I refuse. It's an at at. You'd be ridiculous to call it anything else. Well, there you go. The at at. I didn't even know what it was called, so don't worry. Um, it's it's a long time sequence... controversy because it was all it was it was never said in the movie, but it was written on the toys and written in like books at the time. At hyphen at. Oh, it's all terrain. Armoured Transport is what it stands for. And I genuinely don't have that up in front of me, and I feel really sad right now. <laughs> but the at it's it's an acronym you wouldn't say AT-AT. Fair enough. Because Even... if you say AT-AT, then you'd be calling C-3PO Stutterpro. <laughs> like, you, you wouldn't merge it together like a word. You would, you just That's a weird thing to do. I do call him that in my own head. <laughs> um, the... Uh, even even that though feels personal because we know yes. the rebels from the last film and because right. we really sense that danger of shit they're coming for them and again what you described how do they get out of this and i think it it is this film's power is emotionally charged moments you know the vader fight uh, luke in the cave with vader it's just got some there's a reason because i think the the challenge in a way with this film is it's hard to not review it and go, oh, it's also iconic, isn't it? But you have to review why it's become iconic because you have to review the film for the film. So I would love to just sit here and be like, it's also iconic, you know, the scene with Darth Vader and Luke. Wow. But you you have to you have to kind of go, well, why did it become iconic? And I think it became I- iconic because it resonated, because the characters yeah. resonated and you felt something for those characters. And yet that's partly a result of the film before it and in the end 
the films after it. But mm. this I... film itself does a very brave, without going off on a Last Jedi thing, but it, I can see why people compare them, because yes, it isn't... Was, yeah, this is in my notes. <laughs> it, isn't, it isn't a new hope again. It is something yes. completely different, and I only hope that in 40 years' time, people feel the way they do about this film now, about Last Jedi. Yeah, Because <laughs> uh, obviously I, uh... this was incredibly controversial when it first came out. Yeah, a lot of the choices were. I, I, there are multiple videos on YouTube if you people want to look into it. It's often it's often forgotten because of its financial success. That critically, there were there were it was mixed. Um, some people loved it. Some people really took exception to the choices made. Um, a lot of people took exception to not putting Leia with Luke. Um, a lot of people took exception to the choice of revealing Luke's father to be Vader, thinking it was too convoluted. Um, people took exception to some of the choices in terms of the, the focusing on the characters, not the action. Um, yeah, it, it, it was a, um, it wasn't critically beloved out the gate, which is weird because a lot of like, if you look through the trivia, it often is referred to as a commercial and critical success. I, I would challenge the critical part. Do go, if, if you're interested in people, I do recommend Googling that and looking into, I, I can't remember. I saw a really good YouTube video. And it might've been on film joy movies with Mikey, where he looked back in the wake of, in the wake of Last Jedi, at the the, the the people's feelings towards Empire at the time, um, and yeah, I agree with you. I, we can only hope that in because I think the Last Jedi is an absolute masterpiece. Because how I don't want to see the same thing every movie. Come on, like if the, when the crux of your criticism is they change too much or they're doing too much different and interesting things, well then fuck off. Like go it watch also, the first one seventeen times. Like I don't, I'm not here to. to I don't want to talk to you. Like you, it you know. also, it, it also in the same way as this is. It's one of the for me what I love about Last Jedi is it's one of the most. I think I honestly think it's one of the most exciting films. Like I get swept up in it, and you know I get why some people don't like you know the Rose and um, Finn stuff plot and stuff but i think that adds so much to the world and the and the story and stuff like that and and it's because like empire those moments are charged with emotion yeah and i think well you know yeah yeah, well and that's i I wrote this down while you were speaking because i I was like i must remember to say this emotionally charged moments linked with stakes and action though they're tied Mm. intrinsically together and that's i think why it works Luke's emotional state is tied to his action, both his choices to come and save them and his fight with Vader. You know, the emotion, the emotionally charged Leia and Han stuff is linked to the action and the story and the plot, betrayal plot, and the, you know, Vader freezing Han. Like, it's all, the, it's very, very well interwoven. It's not just a movie of character stuff, it's character stuff that's developing with really clever plot stuff that helps bring that out the script well, here is probably the one of the best scripts star wars has ever had yeah so what as a result of that, th- that's genius you know let's do let's do the kind of the new characters because like before lando isn't it crazy that just seemingly just the design and the cool design of boba fett made him a legend because yeah. He doesn't do much in this film, and he does nope. even less, even well, worse. Well, he gets killed in, in the return. next one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In, in, well, in until recent a, changes to uh, recent changes to canon aside, <laughs> in a very in a very sort of offbeat comedy moment in return. So, isn't it nuts that that character yeah. became so iconic? And yeah. it's hard not to go. It's because he looks cool. <laughs> It is. It's a hundred percent because he looks cool. He Boba Fett as a character captures people's imaginations because he looks cool. It's literally that simple. And what's interesting as well is obviously they, they, Boba Fett had a weird journey to being on screen because he was on the, the, that costume was in the production of A New Hope, but he didn't end up in the theatrical release because obviously the scene where Han and Jabba talk. Wasn't yeah, it's in added the theatrical after, release. Yeah. That was added after. Um, it was shot, so Boba Fett was present but they just put the costume away and then brought it back at a later time. Then he was in the uh, in an animated short that was part of the Star Wars Christmas special, which mm. Lucas burnt every copy of. <laughs> um, you know, Lucas made sure that didn't get much. So it, 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 Boba Fett appeared twice, only to be sort of removed from public consciousness by Lucas's efforts, either deleting the scene from A New Hope or... 
um, you know, <laughs> wanting no one ever to see the Star Wars holiday special out of sheer embarrassment. Boba Fett finally showing up in this is like weird because I feel like in a weird way the image of Boba Fett was already accidentally imparted into the subconscious of the Star Wars fans, even if they'd never seen it. <laughs> you know, or they'd only seen it in the uh, in the in the in the Christmas special. Um, so yeah, so he gets on screen here, and you're right, it's absolutely he's. And I wrote this down in my notes though. He is good here. He is a menacing presence. Um, the fact he says and does so little, but he's so blooming in this movie he's the only one clever enough to figure out what's going on with han and han's escape plan he's the one that tracks him to bespin to cloud city you know he he he's not interested in anything but getting his bounty that's intriguing it's almost like the less you know the more you are interested it's that old thing of somebody whispers you lean in you know they draw you in sometimes it's better to whisper than to shout sort of thing um i think mm. that's part of it you're right though mm. they magoo him completely the next movie he becomes completely ineffectual and is disposed of and dispatched in the shittest of ways and in that in the light of that you do go how that character has eternally sort of existed and been such a popular force is kind of insane and it is purely based on this film because it can't be based on jedi because again Jedi just turns him into Mr. Magoo. It's it, it's embarrassing. It is right. You are right. It is interesting that uh, it is a cool moment where Han is cleverly hiding on on the outside of the ship by just sort of going along with mm-hmm. it, and then Boba is the only one that's realised and follows them. That is that is pretty swish. That is pretty cool. And Boba doesn't seem too intimidated by Vader. There's a point when he stands up to Vader and was like, "I need him alive." Like what the yeah. fuck are you doing and vader's like you'll get your money <laughs> shut up <laughs> yeah vader just like waves him off but the fact that he even had the courage to do that when we've had multiple scenes in this movie of vader having murdered his own crew um oh yeah that's what i was gonna say this film is essentially <laughs> the story of a man slowly going through admirals <laughs> <laughs> i really i, I really like the noticed idea that that the admiral's training watch. campaign the Admiral training campaign, the final module is just how to not die at Vader's hands. And it's like, so don't, and it's, it's a bullet point. It's like, don't disappoint him. Don't piss him off. If you do, stay quiet. <laughs> it's really, I don't know how much of a deliberate choice it is, but I really loved, like, the the slow, like, the first guy that gets promoted is like, ooh, yeah, hee hee, hoo hoo. But then by the time it's like the third dude, he's just like, oh, shit. <laughs> because the third one they don't even show it they just show the aftermath there's just a dude being picked up off the floor like a body being removed <laughs> which is almost like played like a joke like if you were writing that as a comedy that is exactly how you would structure the joke you show him yeah. killing the first one and then being to the second one well you're the bloody you're, you're my new admiral now and the guy being like excellent sir and looking very unfortunate and like un- un- you know unconfident about it because he's worried he's going the same way and then eventually escalating to just where you cut to a, uh, one of the bridges and they're just removing a body <laughs> because Vader's clearly just killed is, someone else there is I mean it's, it's perfectly comedic it's amazing to me that it doesn't doesn't end up playing as a joke but it definitely should Whilst it's more subtle than A New Hope, which is very funny, it is. There are some real comedy moments in this film. Yes, like obviously, obviously, there's the Yoda of it all. Um, we'll talk about that. Yeah, I think yeah, I want, I, so, yeah we'll, we'll bring we'll, we'll do a little whole thing on Yoda. I think in a minute because I've, I've yeah. Blocked. So what? So what about Lando then? What's your what's your views on Lando? Oh, oh sorry. I thought I, th- I think you were going to make a point about the comedy. I didn't mean to interrupt. I know I have no point other than uh, there are some I can't yeah that's the trouble because I went it's a very fu- it's it's got its funny moments and in my head I went think of one you can't it's all right never mind yeah it <laughs> it is an interesting one in that sense isn't it because it plays everything so straight even the comedy moments don't feel like comedy moments apparently Lucas no. was mad he envisioned the scene where the Millennium Falcon escapes the giant sort of space slug as a comedic sequence and when he saw it with audiences he didn't understand why they didn't react to it that way. They were enthralled and excited, and what a cool surprise, you know. Because um, mm. I and I can tell you right now, one thing I do remember as a kid is being so blown away by that idea. Because I was like, they're in a cave, they're in a cave. Like it was shocking to me that they weren't in a cave. Um, yeah, it does capture but, the imagination without a doubt. 
Yeah, the movie is still full of tons of imagination. I think even, like, people always go, oh, it's so lazy, they just put it on an ice planet. I'm like, yeah, but when the last movie didn't have no ice planet, that's pretty clever. Like, we, yeah. one extreme condition to another. That's that's it's like the opposite of tattooing. That's actually pretty smart, right? To give us a different visual aesthetic and a different, like, yeah, circumstance. I, and, I, to, and to show the variation of planets in the Star Wars world. I, I was on board with that, but anyway. Yeah, I think it, it, it in a way, it... it it builds. I don't want to keep repeating points. It, the way it builds the world is it, it is it makes it more personal, but it really does extend the universe out yes. in the ways that you've just described. Yeah. You know, different types of planet because there was nothing like Cloud City either. Different yes. the fact that there's the fact that there's not everyone these characters knew were from Tatooine or um, you know um, mm-hmm. the uh, um, the planet that got blown up. Alderaan. You know, it's Alderaan. So it, yeah. it absolutely does extend the world. Yeah, it, it really does. Like, it, yeah, I and mean, I mean, that's partly budgetary. They had a, they had more money this time. Um, not a shocker. Um, uh, you know, and, and and they really got to explore the world a bit more. And they and they took a reasonable amount of advantage of that. I think there's a pretty good variation in this movie, and it's pretty creative. And that that slug scene I thought was massively creative. That slug scene is, I guess, kind of. Mm. Not quite, but almost the equivalent to the trash compactor sequence from the previous movie, um, and uh, it's it, yeah. The, the whole meteorite chase is really cool too. To be honest with you, I, that scene is yeah. I love that sequence. So for those who don't remember, there's a point when Han and Leia are escaping. They don't have hyperdrive. Which, by the way, again, what a clever script move. Take away their hyperdrive. Yeah. Then what? That's a that's a very, that's a tense, clever idea. It's simple. And it's small scale, they just simply don't have the hyperdrive, but it means they have to be scrappier and think smarter about it. And and, and like in the first movie where the solutions to some of the problems are actually quite clever, I think, yeah, I think Han's whole plan to get them out of that situation is kind of genius. Um, you know, fl- floating away with the trash, as it were. Um yeah so and, and that and like i said i th- that meteorite sequence is one of my favorites it's so, so it's such an exciting little sequence and it is often forgotten between obviously the hoth sequence which is very visually iconic and the luke vader fight but um yeah such a fun sort of i don't know it's probably only a couple minutes long but yeah a little chase through the meteorite field with tie fires exploding everywhere yes please um so yeah, in terms of the comedy, um, yeah, you, the comedy is not as overt in this one as the first one. I don't think it necessarily it plays everything so straight. I don't think the movie even knows when it's trying to be funny. <laughs> uh, but there are some there, there are definitely chuckles here, uh, particularly relating to Yoda. And I do think there's a few C three PO related chuckles towards the end of the movie. Well, yeah, when the, especially when Chewie's rebuilding him, um, oh, and he great. he puts him on, and Chewie's 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 laughter when C three PO is like, "I'm the wrong way round," like Chewie's it's almost like Chewie knew exactly what he was doing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's definitely Chewie played, played a as. prank. Yep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what uh, what were your what was your Yoda Yoda thoughts? Now, now, now. Hi, this is Jackass. I'm Chewbacca, and today we're gonna put his head on backwards. Now, 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 down, did it, down, did it, did I just like the idea now that Chewie's like the ship's prankster, and we never see it. <laughs> yeah. He's constantly well, getting like pushed. The he, they've got, they've got, they've got a, a shopping trolley, a shopping cart, as you'd say in the in the US, on the Millennium Falcon, and they push him into walls in it. <laughs> I like the idea that it's uh, it's always followed by the jackass music. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> anyway, um, I, someone needs to do an edit of that scene where he puts the head on, laughs, and then the jackass music kicks in. Um, anyway. Um, I forgot what we were talking about. I'm sorry. Yoda, Yoda. Well, Yoda, Yoda. and I, we've not we've not done Lando either. So Yoda oh, and Lando. Do, yeah. Okay. We'll start. We'll start with Lando then. Um, yeah. I, I, Billy D. Williams is a is a is a genius. I mean, I love the character. I think it's really clever cast design when you set up a character as a counter as a as a as a, as a, as a sorry as a contemporary to Han, but then reveal he's actually a counter to Han. So when we're meeting or heading to meet Lando, he is set up as Han says to Leia, he's a scoundrel, you'd like him. <laughs> you know. Um but then you meet him and he's taken a very different path to Han in life. And 
just by simply having Han set him up as an old friend and a bit of a scoundrel, you're expecting a Han type character. And it's not lost on me how clever it is these days. When I rewatch it, when Lando shows up, if you go in with that mindset, it's surprising, number one. But number two, it's like, oh, there's a different path for Han. Look at Lando. He's gone legit. It feels... Also, it feels false, which I love, because Billy Dee Williams adds something that's not on the page. So that in the script, he has just gone legit, right? It's a scoundrel turned legit and a contrast to Han that you, you compare Han against and go, see, you you could be better. You could get out of this life. You could make a proper sort of person out of yourself if you didn't, you know, if you weren't such a scamp, you, you lovable rascal, yeah. Um, but on the page, uh, that's one thing. Billy Dee Williams adds this whole incredible layer of falseness to it like a very deliberate i'm putting on that i'm a really slick guy now because i just see myself that way and it all feels like the real lando is just under the surface at any moment ready to burst through and that that character is still who he was back in the day but now it's under all this pomp and circumstance that he's putting himself in and it's 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 you know he's 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 almost a bit of a fraud and he's waiting to be found out and it's kind of amazing and it's all yes layered through billy d williams performance but it's a it's genius one of the best setup for the character the, it's one of the best performances in the trilogy isn't it like yeah it really beautiful. is and and yeah. Donald Glover did such a great job replicating it and giving the same feeling as it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And it was and with that one they had the hindsight, you know, they had the the benefit of hindsight. They 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 know how the La- the Lando character played in the final movie, you know. So the script for Solo also sets Han up as not Han sorry, uh, Lando up as a bit false. Mm. Um it's something I feel like they didn't really understand about the Lando character when they did him in uh Rise of Skywalker. But the, the yeah, solo, but that's they, because, they got it. Like, they nailed it. <laughs> but that's because in Rise of Skywalker, he's filling the nostalgic hero role. Because it always, like, plays a little false when they're all like, oh, we know who you are. It's Lando. And it's like, I understand why you like that with Luke, Leia, and Han. But there's not much, too much reason to be like it with Lando. Um, and yeah, but that's that's the role the character is serving in in that film, mm-hmm. isn't it? Yeah, um, yeah. So what about so what yeah? About Yoda? So I rambled about Lando for ages, and you didn't get to say much. Anything you want to add on Lando? No, I completely agree. I think I think like I say, Billy D. Williams, I think is one of the best performances in in the whole trilogy. Um, and I'd never thought of it too deeply, but I love what you the point you made about how it he makes Han look better by seeming to be better Han and then it turns out no he's not like <laughs> and exactly. it's done really well but equally you buy the turn really well as well if you th- if you really think about what that can- the turns that character has to go through in this one yeah, film it's, it's, a, it's a hard sell isn't it because it's, it it's only what, 20 minutes of screen time and he goes from one extreme to another extreme to another extreme yeah and it's all it all it passes purely on Billy D Williams's performance i think because even even the script like with the final turn when he decides to save them it, you know there's not too much on the page for that um no. but but no. billy d williams does a great job um it's a good, in terms it's a good of, arc know, for a character though it's 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 a wonderful because posi- you understand what i like about the way they've written him is you do understand even though it's not 100 percent on the page you do understand every change that lando goes through you understand his circumstance when you first get there you understand why he felt pressured by the Empire. And it, and, it, and actually, that does two things. It tells you a lot about Lando, but it also sets up how much fear there is in the galaxy of the Empire. The idea that Lando would betray an old friend just to keep the Empire from getting too involved on, on, on Cloud City. That's incredible. Like, that makes a lot of sense, tells you a lot about the world, um, makes you kind of hate the Lando character. Um, and then watching him slowly realize, and you know, that famous line, this deal's getting worse all the time, you know. Uh, watching it play out and see him slowly, like, realize how bad this is and is getting, and then ultimately choose to help the heroes, um, is it works really well, I think. Yeah, completely agree. Um, the Yoda, I just, the thing, the thing I was really captured by is, the, the, again, the performance of Frank Oz, because the turn... So good. When he he goes from playful jolly Yoda and like playing the fool, being the comic relief almost to yes. I'm the Jedi Master, is phenomenal. Like because you rewatch this film 
And you're like, oh, God, Yoda's... At first, when he comes on, you're like, oh, God, Yoda's just a joke in this film, isn't he? And then, like, that turn, you're like, oh, no, there's the there's the well-defined character that will will go on and, and be that character for the whole, for the whole yeah. thing. Like, it's... Um, totally it's intentional, stunning. too. Like, it, you know, designed to throw you off. You meet him, you go, who's this clown? They knew exactly that, that you know, it's not like it was written that way. And then they change their minds or just try to do something different. It's, it's a very deliberate attempt by the wise Yoda character to irritate Luke to see how patient he is, basically. Yeah. Not and very. Ge- yeah, not very at all. <laughs> that boy. Oh, like how quick is he back in his, in his old teenage moaning ways in this movie? I was half expecting him to tell Yoda he wanted to go to the Toshi station to pick up some power converters. <laughs> um. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's it's pretty. <laughs> it's a it's a yeah. We'll talk. I mean, we'll talk a little bit about Luke later. But the um, I, yeah, you're right. It's genius. He's he he he's funny, slightly annoying, but really charming. And you kind of it's it's yeah. It's such a a fun character. You already you like the character for that anyway. You don't even need what he then becomes. But the true genius is then that he becomes you know, and that idea that you know, because what what's so clever about the entire Luke training sequence? Is it all links to the same message about things mm. aren't how they seem? You know, um, Luke doesn't understand that a small package doesn't, or a visual, you know, a, a fact that he thinks he knows doesn't actually necessarily define the thing. He thinks Yoda is going to be this tall, strapping hero. You know, he thinks it's physically impossible to get that X Wing out of that water. And it's his own, it's his own constant thinking and deciding what things are that holds him back. Mm. Um, and it's demonstrated both in his reaction to Yoda, um, and then his reaction to the Tie Fight. The, the, sorry, the X Wing being pulled out of the, the swamp. I mean, it's one of the best lines in the movie. I don't believe it, and that is why you fail. Oh come on, that's so good. <laughs> That's that so whole X wing scene is X wing sing X wing scene is just mm-hmm. stunning. Like R two D 2s reaction, Luke's bemusement. Um, yeah, it's brilliant, and yeah. it shows the, the like, point how Yoda's far... making about him overthinking it. Like, yeah, yeah. and Incredible. especially in the wider context of now, like how he is in um, his recent appearance. Just in case, I don't want to spoil that. Um, but yeah, like just uh, the thing he popped up in recently, amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, it's, yeah, it's very good. Yeah. Very, very good. Did you have any? What are your? What are your? What are your other quick fire notes, Daniel? Um, I, well, some stuff but, I wanted to touch on that we didn't talk about last week. Well, two things. Um, first of all, we never talked about the fan, the fanfare, and the opening crawl. Um, mm. What a creative idea! Harkens back to the old like Flash Gordon serials of like the fifties. Um, Lucas got into a lot of trouble as a result of it with um, the guilds. Um, basically, he wanted to preserve that dramatic opening, you know, the the fanfare and the text crawl. But at the time, the guilds insisted you credit top and back of the movie, which is why all movies had that opening, used to have that opening title sequence. And these days, they allow you to put that at the back end of the movie. Um, but Lucas insisted on moving all the credits to the back of the movie. Now on A New Hope, because the movie wasn't expected to be very successful, it wasn't really on their radar, they were annoyed, but they kind of allowed it. They sort of begrudgingly let Lucas do that. Um, on this movie, because it was you know one of the biggest movies of all time, um, they tried to get this movie pulled from release. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, they were unsuccessful, um, and they actually fined Lucas heavily. For this choice, they actually tried to fire Irvin Kershner, uh, fire fine Irvin Kershner as well, but Lucas paid Irvin Kershner's fines personally. Um, it was <laughs> something. It was. It was. It, I think the Irvin Kershner fine was something like a quarter of a million dollars, um, and I don't think that covers Lucas's own fine. Um, so as a result, Lucas bitterly dropped his own membership to the Writers Guild, Directors Guild, and Motion Picture Association of America. Um, a move that has actually hindered his hiring of directors and staff in subsequent films. Um, he shot himself in the foot a little bit, but um, I don't blame him. They tried to pull his movie and then they fined him a fucking yeah, million yeah. dollars. Like, especially shitty. for some, 
for something that now, not obviously the cruel element of it, but, you know, credits being at the end for something that now feels so modern and accepted and, you know, all the mm-hmm. rest of it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the, the crawl itself is such an iconic part of these movies. We didn't really cover it. And, uh, you know, everything from John Williams' amazing score to the, to, you know, the, you know, and even that opening, you know, um, uh, you know, Galaxy Far Away stuff. It's 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 so iconic now. You almost forget it's part of the movie. Like you don't even think about it. Like it, it, oh, the fact that we gives... reviewed a New Hope and never talked about a long time ago in a Galaxy Far Far Away, it never came up. <laughs> Considering it how iconic one of the it is. Most, it was one of the most. Like I didn't quite realize how much because of everything I talked about last week. How much affection I had mm-hmm. for Star Wars. Until I sat in, I think, a midnight screening of mm-hmm. The Force Awakens. You have, and when got, that we music, have got the same story. <laughs> when that music and the cruel hit, mm-hmm. I just, like, I reacted emotionally. Like, mm-hmm. my heart leapt. And it was like, uh, uh, uh. like, it, yeah. So it's, it's, it's so yes. iconic. It's incredible. Yeah, I got to, I was very lucky. I got to see Force Awakens. Um, a little bit early ahead of release and it was a big screen and a very I was very relieved it was a it was a it was an IMAX screen but only a handful of people in a you know sort of several hundred seat cinema so I had a lot of space and I was very relieved because I reacted to that <laughs> strongly and I was very glad I had <laughs> I had the ability to... There was someone sat a row to in front of me that knew I loved the movie, uh, you know, was a big fan, and was just more casually there, just out of like, oh, it's a a new movie. It turned around afterwards and directly to look at me and be like, did you like it? Because they knew how much it meant to me, and I was so glad they didn't turn around (laughs) any earlier in the movie. Because when the fanfare hit, I was... Yeah, that really hit me. So uh, I 100% agree. Super quick, my... uh favorite story i've got like that is is kind of the reverse is when i i saw <laughs> infinity war at i think it was no it was end game i saw end game at midnight with some mates and oh, was it was infinity no it was end game one of them end game i think i saw end it was end game because it was the hawkeye scene i was gonna say um, i think it I, was end game because i think you've told me this story i i saw it i saw it at midnight screening and i drunkenly ordered backup tickets for the following day at like 11 30 or maybe a bit late maybe like two o'clock in the afternoon it was two o'clock two o'clock in the afternoon in case i fell asleep needed the loo whatever and um didn't need the loo didn't fall asleep so went to the two o'clock screening but was running late for it because i'd had a call or something had slowed me down but obviously i wasn't in too much of a panic because i'd already seen the film walked in had a seat where and also that was the other reason i wasn't being disrespectful i knew my seat was at the top of the of the steps so i i was at the very back but i knew i didn't have to disturb anyone either right went in (laughs) went up to my seat just felt this unbelievable sense of what the fuck is wrong with you from all these intense fans that didn't know i'd already seen it before that were just like he's missing it he's he's a bit casual for this isn't he I sit down in between these two dudes who were clearly there on their own. And literally, as I sat down, I heard them both go, because they were like, oh, this guy's a priest late. He's going to disturb us. Da, 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 da. And I fucking, I, I, I took with me a baguette. And I reached in. <laughs> I reached in the bag. I got the drink and it was a can. And I opened the drink and the can just went, and literally... I physically felt them tighten next to me. Both of them clenched their fists. And I was like, there's no fucking way I'm eating this baguette. <laughs> like, they yeah. just, that is the problem, isn't it? When you, if you see a movie before and you go in and you're seeing it for the second time. And to them, it's this really important moment. Like I, yeah. I saw Force Awakens um, early and then I went to a midnight screening because I, I wanted to take Nadia. She, she didn't have the opportunity to come see it early with me. So I then I went with Nadia for the midnight screening and it, I was just sat in this absolutely packed screen with so much excitement and speculation just knowing I'd seen the movie like I was like I have I am in so, I'm in such a relaxed state right now. I could go to the toilet midway through it doesn't matter but these people will hate me for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, completely, completely. Um, um yeah, so, yeah, so um, what were your other your other notes? 
Yeah, uh, I just wanted to point out, uh, we, we, one thing I did say last week was that we obviously I, I gave credit to John Williams for his music. But I think one thing we keep I, I keep forgetting to say, and I really should say, is that not, John Williams' music is not just exciting and suspenseful, which it is. It's incredible. Put it under an action scene, it's glorious. And at the time as well, I think orchestras had kind of fallen out of, fa- fallen out of favour. Like doing these traditionally mm. orchestrated scores was not a big... It, it's sort of come back round, and now that's very common again. But like I think in the 70s when this came out, films had moved away from that so it was a bold choice to even get the london symphony orchestra to come do this with john williams but i will say as well the amount of emotion that he conveys in his movie in his movie sorry in his score does sometimes make up for the emotional deficits of the script <laughs> yeah completely yeah, Some, not particularly fair. not putting so much to this one but because this one has a lot of like built-in emotion that's actually present and in the script and follows the characters we talked about. But the um, uh, you look at like the binary sunsets moment from the previous movie. So, you know how much of what's conveyed in that scene, that feeling of longing Luke has to get out and do something else with his life and to you know to 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 go beyond. Some of it's the visual of just him looking off into the you know into the that that binary sunset, but a lot of it's that music. It's and and this movie does it too. Like the, the Imperial March creates a real re- emotional reaction to Vader, like a like a negative one. Um, and Yoda's theme is just an incredible piece of music. It's now just more generically associated with the Star Wars franchise, Yoda's theme. But it's a bit like Hedwig's theme from Harry Potter. It's now just sort of become a Harry Potter theme, but it's actually called yeah. Hedwig's theme. <laughs> um, and it's yeah, Yoda's theme is a very similar thing. If you don't know what I mean, you'll have to, you'll have to Google it. But it, they used a slowed down version of it in the um, Rise of Skywalker trailer, very specifically to uh, evoke which is uh, beautiful, a very strong emotional reaction. But it's an incredible and beautiful piece of music that does invo- does evoke a lot of emotion. So there you go. Um, other yeah. notes. Um, Star Wars, not Star Wars, sorry, uh, Vader, oh, glimp, glimpse behind his helmet. That's pretty fucking epic, isn't it? Um, I remember as a kid, mm. my imagination, Chris, because uh, as I explained last week, I got to see this movie on VHS in like, like 95, 96, I think just before the, the re-releases. And um, the near glimpse of Vader's head. When, and, it, and, no, and nothing more in this movie. I had to wait a week to watch Return of the Jedi. I desperately wanted to know what he looked like under there. <laughs> desperately. It's such a great scene. But wasn't it like, it's not just that, which obviously is then kind of answered in the end, but I was really struck on this rewatch of how, I and I, I wouldn't have kind of, if you'd have asked me, is there any of this in there? I'd have been like, I'm not sure. But there is. It, the turn is slightly foreshadowed. Like, when the Emperor is essentially like, he's a Skywalker, mm. let's get him. Vader's very like, no, 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 hold up, hold up. Um, We can turn him. He's, you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. Vader's, you know, and in the in the original Emperor scene, and I didn't check to see whether this dialogue, if the dialogue felt slightly different, so maybe you can tell me. But The, like, the, the dialogue you know, is a little just, different, yeah. It's not he as says implicit he, in the... In the new yeah. one, no. In the original yeah. one, he says he's just a boy. You know, it's kind of that sense of that fatherly. No, nah, he's just a boy. Leave him be. And I was like, oh, the turn is the turn is like the seeds at the mm-hmm. very least. The early seeds of the turn are planted in this movie. Yes, and I would say they're planted in this movie in multiple ways. One of the bigger ones that I mean, I how many years have I been watching this movie regularly? It really struck me on this viewing specifically when I watched it last night for this. How clear the betrayal is. He says to Luke right at the end, essentially, if you team up with me, we could take out the Emperor and rule the galaxy together. That's what he implies. I don't even think yeah. he's implying do it under the Emperor. He implies between us. The old man's got no chance. <laughs> That's an incredibly bold, like, statement to make this early in the fact before we establish. Um, he doesn't directly say it. He, like, implies it heavily. He talks about... I can't remember how he phrases it. I wish... I need the transcript. One second. Because I, I want to I point out that I, he doesn't directly... I don't want people to think I'm misquoting it. Uh, but he... Uh, but yeah, it's, it's very implicit in this movie um, that that's the... Oh, for fuck's sake. I thought I had the transcript and some other random bullshit opened. 
really upsetting. Um, here we go. So it's up here. Let me see. Turn to the dark side. No. Oh, God. I'm never going to find it in this script, am I? Uh I feel like I should be helping, but I don't have uh, I don't have the transcript open. So, <laughs> oh, here you go. Search your feelings. You know it to be true. You can destroy the emperor. He has foreseen this. It is your destiny. Join me, and together we can rule the galaxy as father and son. So, there's two ways you could read that. One is the emperor has seen you could destroy him. So, how about you join us and don't do that? But the other way you could read that is. You can destroy the Emperor. He knows that. It's your destiny to do that. So join me, destroy the Emperor, and the two of us can fucking rule. That yeah, is yeah. very cleverly written. Very cleverly written. I only picked up on it on this viewing. Genius. Yeah. It's um, in, it's for for a film that didn't necessarily know where it's going and for you know, for for the kiss or whatever, there is a mm-hmm. lot embedded in which is you know relevant and stuff and and foreshadows yeah um i did put yeah i did i like the the vader luke fight is great for a couple of reasons but one of the things i do love is the constant sort of taunting from vader trying to get luke angry Mm. um that really makes the scene play brilliantly um we've not seen vader be this chatty in a fight before i don't think (laughs) it's good um mark has actually seen him move in a fight (laughs) Well, yeah, that too. That too. Uh, Mark Hamill's acting here is incredible, um, particularly the, um, the uh, you know, the, the, the I am your father moment. Uh, Luke, just yeah, such raw emotion and such mixed. And th- it, the no doesn't even come straight away. In my mind, when I remember that scene, it's I am your father. No, but it's not. It's, it's, it's denial first. Even it's... It's all of them. Like, I don't think like I don't think it gets talked about enough. Like, I nearly said earlier, Harrison Ford's acting when he realizes they're not on a rock. They're they you know they're in the belly of some sort of monster, and his sudden we're out of here. Like, it's it's all really great. Mm. Well, actually, while we're on that subject, I, I, something I wanted to ask you about, Chris, as our resident love story fan, mm. you know. As as the guy that when we review TV, you're looking for the love story nine yeah, times out of always. ten. You love that. Yeah, yeah. I'm on board. I, l- I love that about you. What mm. do you reckon to the hand layer story and how it plays out here? Yeah, do, do, I think do, it's... Do, uh, well, you, do you believe it? Is there enough time dedicated to it? Do, do they earn the, the iconic moment that we will talk about in a little bit? Because there's, there's so many conflicting stories about how that moment came to be. But um, res- we'll put that aside for a second. Just in general, do you think they earn it? In this film, it's difficult because uh, you know what I the the only scene of it I don't like is when they trip and are going. I think it's when they are leaving the monster or when they first go in the asteroid film um, asteroid field and Leia lands on Han's lap and he kinds of keep, kind of keeps her there. Otherwise, other than that scene, which I just think just feels a bit wrong, um, mm. I. I think it's. I think Carrie Fisher, the subtle looks when Han walks away, the subtle kind of oh, shit. He's right. I do. I do have feelings for him. Like the you. You can tell she plays being annoyed because he's right beautifully, um, mm. and I think in a way the the the, the other properly defending it now. The other benefit of the the half. Luke Han thing is it setting up a world where lots of time has passed and the notion that and actually the dialogue and their acting in that first scene of fine go well you don't want me to go do you the notion that this has been it feels like it's been <laughs> bubbling well, for it feels a while. like he's been he's been slightly harassing her for many months <laughs> it, yeah but it feels like it it feels like it does feel earned because it feels it doesn't feel sudden because it feels like there's an awful lot that we haven't seen off script haven't seen off screen. So, yeah, I think it does. I think it does play. What do you, what are you what are your thoughts? 
Yeah, I, I think it does work well. And I think you're right. They take advantage of the idea that time has passed to establish a dynamic where Han is kind of so... like, And it's, it's, it's weirdly charming, and it absolutely shouldn't be. He's convinced she likes him. She's convinced he's in, she's into him, and she's denying it. And it's basically a movie of Han taunting her until he proves himself right. <laughs> and mm. that shouldn't work on paper. But it does work quite simply because of the power of Harrison Ford's performance and the character they've established in Han. Yeah. And that leads us to that iconic moment, which we haven't talked about, and we probably should. Um, Princess Leia says, I love you. And Han Solo, with the most perfect response of all time, replies, I know. Now, I'll very quick, I'll hit on the trivia for that now while we're here, because it's fucking... I, I don't know the truth. So, the story as I heard it, and this is more Star Wars myth-busting, I guess, although I don't have the answer here. The story I know and knew from, from as a kid, and is part of the Empire of Dreams documentary, that Han, that, that Han Solo, that um, Lawrence... Uh, no, sorry, Irvin Kirshner and Harrison Ford tell, is that they were trying the scene on set, filming it, filming it, filming it. Nothing worked, nothing worked. They couldn't get it right. Because he was reading the scripted line, which they say was I love you too, but I've got another line that it was supposed to be, um, that, that Lawrence Kasdan wrote that he claims it was supposed to be. But either way, the line as scripted was not working. And eventually, after several takes, um, I, Irvin Kershaw just said to Harrison Ford, just go, just do it, just be Han, just don't think about it, just go. And he said, I know, and it ended up in the movie. There are some alternate versions of this story. <laughs> um, oh, uh, Lawrence Kasdan, Kasdan insists that the line wasn't simply I love you too, as Harrison Ford remembers it, but it was supposed to be just remember that, Leia, because I'll be back. So she says I love you, and he replies, remember that, because I'll be back. Which is also good. Which is good, not as good as the line we got. Oh, God, no. No, no, no. It's amazing. The line we got it's, is stunning. It says so much about their relationship, him as yes. a character, how he feels about her. It's it's wonderful. It's 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 some of the finest writing mm-hmm. or improv, depending on who you believe, going. <laughs> yeah. So the one of the other versions of the story is actually not that it was a day of stress where they couldn't get the scene right and he and Harrison Ford had this moment of genius. The the other version of the story is that the line was, just remember that layer because I'll be back, was not pleasing to Harrison Ford, who did not want to come back for the third movie. He liked the idea of his character going out heroically in this one. So he didn't want to say that line. Because that says I'll be back. And he hadn't signed yeah. on for the third movie. It's worth noting, contractually, um, uh, Mark Hamill and Carrie Fisher have both signed on for the subsequent two films. Harrison Ford had simply signed on for one more film. Mm. So he didn't have been want to come awful, back necessarily for the third one. That would have been an awful way to end the character. Like literally frozen. Like nah. Yeah, bad. well, I mean that's the thing is he when when he made that deal he wanted he didn't want to be frozen. He wanted to be killed. Right, he wanted right. the, he wanted it, the, it to not work yeah. and him to die. Um that was Han, uh, Harrison Ford's preference for that. So obviously Lucas stuck to his guns went for the downer ending but not the we can't get him back ending, if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah. Because because Lucas knew better. <laughs> um, I still think it would have been a very iconic if Han Solo had died at the end of this movie, but, um, you know... Uh, yeah. He, he, what we got's pretty good. It's pretty tense. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, but th- so I don't know which version of the story to believe. Is it the improvised on the spot version? Because they'd had a day of Irvin and Harrison struggling to get the scene right. Um, there's also a third version of the story where... Um, Harrison Ford and Irvin Kershner had met before the f- scene filmed um, and figured out the line and surprised Carrie Fisher with it on the set and she was upset because she had she wanted to be included in the process um, so and, and apparently well either way Lawrence Kasdan is on record of being disappointed his dialogue was changed um, feeling it had become some of his best writing. I disagree with him. I think the line we got is better than what he wrote. But I, to this day, no longer know what the real story is. Because I'm glad we don't know. I like that a moment so iconic is shrouded in that. Yeah, in that and several, several different versions of the story. And, yeah. It's changed on the day in an ad lib. Um, 
because he just said be great. Han Solo. Uh, written because Han Solo, because Harrison Ford is a grumpy fucker who didn't want to do the next one. Rewritten outside of the, the, the shoot, out with, you know, cutting Carrie Fisher out, leaving her feeling a little left. Out. I mean, the, so, yeah, the, the, the legacy of that scene will live forever. Um, yeah. uh, the last note I had before going to the rest of the trip very quickly, I just, I do love that in this movie, just symbolically, that Luke gets his hand cut off and is replaced with a robot hand, sort of symbolically adding to the idea of Luke being essentially on the first steps to becoming his father. Yeah, Who that's established nice. I is is more man than is more machine than man. Do you think it's do you think we need to see it though? Do you think yeah, I suppose for that to work we do need to see the hand and the machine and stuff. Or do you think like because it does, you know, the I I, I don't know exactly, but the time between hand comes off and gets a robot hand is not that do you know what I mean? It's quite quick. Um sure. But I, but I just, we, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the, you know, when we were talking earlier about does this film do enough to lay in the Luke mm. could become his father stuff, the idea that the movie ends with him receiving a robotic l- uh, limb um, feels pretty clear to me. But I, you know, yeah. I, I guess it depends how you, how you, you know. No, uh, no, no, no. I think, I think it works. I think it does work. It's, it, I just, I, it, you, that outweighs this complaint but it is it and it is a classic thing of you know you thor loses an eye and but you know it's it's then he then literally oh finds i see what a, you're saying an eye the, the next film it is it you're saying become... it, you're saying it doesn't feel like he earns getting his hand back it just sort of he loses a thing and then just is given i feel like that cl- like yes. you, you you listed it earlier as one of as part of the cliffhanger and the downbeat ending you know luke's just lost a hand actually by the end of the film yeah. he's got a brand new shiny robot hand yeah that's fair. Hip, hip, i mean i suppose um, me saying luke's just lost a hand is my way of saying luke luke got his ass handed to him but um yeah you're right yes, he does, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they they undo the damage done very quickly that you're right absolutely it might have even been better to leave that with him leave the movie with him not having the hand and open the next movie demonstrating he has a robot hand yeah yeah exactly you know is that is that more exciting for the ending i guess was yeah the, yeah yeah, the I, thought. yeah that's but a... i i prefer the connotations with daft that showing it gives us yes yeah yeah, yeah. So, i wouldn't want to lose one for the other so no, no exactly and, anyway let's let's crack on the trivia there's quite a bit so I'll, i'm gonna go through this as quick as i can because i know we're on a bit of a timer um so I'll I'll do I'll do what I can. Um, in order to avoid yeah. sharing creative rights, George Lucas actually decided to avoid using any major studio to finance this movie, and instead bankrolled the initial 18 million production budget himself, using a wow. combination of profits from A New Hope and a loan from a bank. Um, although the movie was risky, you know, with the previous, th- this is basically a move no one else could in Hollywood could have pulled off. To be yeah. honest with you, because yeah. the success of New Hope was so staggering that even the bank couldn't find an excuse to not loan him millions and millions to make this movie. And it allowed Lucas full creative control and the ability to set up Lucasfilm and the various departments that come out of that Skywalker Sound, ILM, you know, and put them all under one roof on the on the, on the Skywalker Ranch, as they call it. Um, and of course, the, even though it was technically a risky move, it really wasn't. Because you knew the second Star Wars movie was going to make a you know bajillion dollars no matter what, um, and it did of course pay off several times over. Lucas recovered um, his investment investment within three months of the movie's release and uh, showed his gratitude, um, sort of beyond the Hollywood norm, and actually shared the profits with his employees. Um, he gave out about five million dollars in bonuses to wow. the various staff and creatives that worked on this movie. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. Now, what's amazing about that is in the studio system, the move, the movie, the studios bend over backwards to fuck over everyone who worked on a movie. They still, to this day, or to well, very recently, claimed that technically to assert, oh, we, no, was maybe it wasn't a New Hope. There was a really famous, there was a very successful Star Wars movie, one of them that they still claimed didn't make profit, <laughs> so they could not give anyone residuals. It might even just be a new hope. Um, they and you can just do you can just fudge the accounting. You just fudge the accounting, and make it. Like, there was a famous story on the you know club with clerks too regarding this that a lot of Kevin Smith fans will know from his various podcasts where they, with they struggled to get um, the guy who played Randall back for Clerks two, 
because he still hadn't been paid correctly for Clerks One yeah, because they claimed clerks, the that movie was Clerks didn't... Three. That uh, for okay. a while Clerks Three didn't happen because he didn't get paid for Clerks Two. There you go. And he claimed it was they they claimed it wasn't profitable even though it clearly was. They made that money on a shoestring. They moved it there from a shoestring budget. But anyway, so that's very that's very opposite to how these things normally operate. The fact that Lucas went out of his way to give five million dollars in bonuses across his staff. That's incredible. Nuts. What a he, guy. What a, I know. And like you say what you will about like his choice to change these movies, which by the way, we haven't really covered it because there aren't many changes in this movie. There's one big one we'll talk about, but um this movie is the least affected by Lucas's meddling of all the movies. Um which says fact- something about its starting quality, Correct. doesn't it? Correct. Um yeah, absolutely it does. Um I think I understand that the first one obviously he was always frustrated with how it looked because of the budget. Um and then the third one I just think like it was a rough time for everyone. The third one wasn't a wasn't a happy production, I don't think. Um director changes, the, the rumors that George Lucas actually secretly directed it and gave it to someone else in name but actually was doing the, the job himself. Uh, uh, man, we'll talk about that when we get there. But anyway, um yeah, this one has the least sort of adjustments post um initial release uh, compared to the other two um he originally planned um to only executive produce and finance this movie leaving directorial duties in the hands of ivan kirshner and day-to-day producing duties to a guy called gary kurtz um because directing a new hope had basically left lucas exhausted and sick and he had intended to take some time off um to start to focus on the sort of expansion of lucasfilm and spending more time with his wife uh marcia um so he was hoping to sort of start a family and finish construction on Skywalker Ranch. However, production on this movie ran over budget and ran behind schedule. And Lucas had to step in and take a, a more hands-on role to bring it back under. Because, you know, he wasn't a studio with an infinite well of money. He was a person with a, with a personal stake in the movie. And while it was guaranteed to make its profit back, they couldn't go under mid-production. They had to be careful. Um, going on location to oversee he had to end up he ended up going on location to oversee filming and even directed portions of this movie um a, a disastrous rough cut of the movie was produced um and was described as incoherent <laughs> a very similar to what happened with a new hope actually and facing the possibility of financial ruin lucas had re-edited the movie himself with even worse results um extensive reshoots and further post-production effects work was then put uh, put into place, which put an enormous strain on his funds, his health, um, his marriage, and even his relationship with Kirshner and Kurtz, the producer he'd hired. Um, so Lucas actually went on to never work with Kurtz again after this. It put such a strain on their relationship. And very, very sadly, oh, wow. um, Lucas's marriage dissolved about a year or two later. Um, mm. So... Star Wars Which, took a lot from George Lucas. Yeah, like, George Lucas gets a lot of shit, and, you know, without going off on a magic tang- ma- massive tangent about it, I, w- I watched an interview with him the other day, sort of after we finished the podcast, and and he certainly comes across as incredibly family-orientated, and he yes. clearly cares so much about his kids and ultimately stops directing after the original trilogy, to have to 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 adopt more children and and be a father and you know mm. whatever you think about meddling the prequels etc that needs to be separate from from admiring that he is clearly a good yes. person yes i i yeah i mean if 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 the story about him giving 5 million dollars away to his staff to thank yeah. him for working so hard on his movie um isn't enough yeah george lucas is a super nice guy and i think you know, it is kind of a shame that it often gets quite personal when people talk about Star Wars. I am the first person to say those prequels suck, you know. But yeah, I would never, like, personally attack George. He made some terrible choices creatively that I strongly disagree with. But as a person, he is clearly a super nice guy um, and doesn't deserve the, the, the uh, hate he gets. Um After the various increases in budget, the movie became one of the most expensive of its day, and after the bank threatened to pull the loan because the production seemed out of control, Lucas was forced to approach 20th Century Fox yet again and made a deal with the studio to secure a secondary loan um, in exchange for paying the studio more money out of the profits when it releases. Um, But he still managed to maintain his sequel and merchandising rights. Um, and then wow. obviously after the uh, movie's box office success, um, unhappiness 
at the studio over the deal's generosity to Lucas um, caused them to force out Alan Ladd uh, over at Fox, um, who had been the, one of the producers on the first movie too. Um, and he was a long-time ally of Lucas. He had gotten the first Star Wars made, um, and he had helped Lucas get that second bit of money from them when the second movie went, went over budget and allowed Lucas to keep sequel and merchandising rights and they ousted him for it um this was uh, this was such a uh, this upset lucas so much that when he when he started working on uh, raiders of the lost ark he took it to paramount not fox for that very reason um so there you go wow. <laughs> it's interesting it's, it's amazing that the student didn't try and you, you know collect up those merchandising purchasing merchandising rights isn't well, it I, I i think that's down to this alan lad guy i think he was looking after lucas and i think he and that's why they fired him they, they i think that is yeah. what the studio wanted and i think alan lad um very much protected lucas's interests there yeah because i agree you want the loan you want you want a bit more money to make your movie happen right well give us the thing you took from us last time like <laughs> you know we know what this is worth now we're not going to make that same mistake twice it would have been the studio's yeah. Uh, position otherwise so yeah <laughs> where, where um, do you think you got that five million to give to shout the bonuses from <laughs> well presu- yeah well uh, presumably the, well the bonuses then ha- that that would have been j- mid-production i guess the five million bonuses would have been post-release when all the money actually rolled in um there was just yeah. this tight moment in the middle of production when they were going beyond lucas's means and they didn't have a studio because normally if a movie goes of a budget a studio can commit more money to a movie to finish it but he didn't have that, and he was already at his limit. So that's how that ended up happening. That's why he had to go back to the studio. Um, but yeah, so there you go. Um, let's move on to the, through the other stuff. The rest of it's a lot shorter and less involved, as trivia goes. Uh, Mark Hamill banged his head 16 times on the ceiling of Yoda's hut before director Irvin Kirshner was satisfied <laughs> with the scene. I question whether Irvin Kirshner just didn't like Mark Hamill. But there you go. Uh, <laughs> 16 <laughs> times seems fucking excessive. <laughs> Um, George Lucas was so impressed by Frank Oz's performance as Yoda, he spent thousands of dollars of his own money on an advertising with an advertising company to get him an Oscar nomination for Best Actor in a Supporting Role. Uh, the, com- the campaign ultimately failed because it was felt a puppeteer wasn't the same as an actor. Lucas felt this wasn't fair to Oz, who <laughs> reportedly did not care. <laughs> I love Frank Oz. <laughs> I love Frank Oz so much. Um, (coughs) When shooting uh, on location in Norway, uh, a fierce snowstorm hit the hotel where the cast and crew were staying. This would have normally halted filming, but Irvin Kirshner was not discouraged. And when he opened the front door of the hotel and found that the snow was up past his chest, he took the gap between that and the frame of the door as enough space to point a camera out it. And um, had Mark Hamill leave the hotel through other means and walk about in the snow outside of the hotel and f- they all filmed from inside the hotel's doorway camera pointing through the gap to get shots of Luke walking through the frozen tundra wow <laughs> poor Mark Hamill the only one freezing his balls off <laughs> yeah you do feel like Mark Hamill suffered for it like so far this trip has been reasons Mark Hamill suffered his car crash his fucking yeah. his getting hit on the head <laughs> like 16 freezing. times yeah, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, so that's how they shot the, sh- the, the the shot of Luke wandering out of the snow after he'd escaped the, the Wampa cave. Um, yeah, all the cameramen stayed inside in the to- toasty warmth. And, I, and to add to that, um, they they didn't really have a lot of patience with Mark Hamill on set either. It, it was a real nightmare to shoot all the Yoda stuff because it, it was a controlled set, but there was a lot going on. The set was built on a platform that was a few feet up so that Yoda could move along the floor with Hamill. And, and there was all these predetermined gaps in the floor where the the hand could come up through and control the puppet, right? Um, but they couldn't really hear each other because Frank Oz is under the floor and Mark Hamill is uh, on top and it was really hard to do scenes. So they gave Mark Hamill a little radio transmitter he could put in one ear and turn his head so it wasn't facing the camera so he could hear the dialogue. Um, and this really helped, except for that occasionally, <laughs> according to Mark, it would occasionally pick up Radio 1 because they were filming in the UK. <laughs> So he'd be in the middle of a scene, he'd be like, hey, I got the Stones! Because they'd be suddenly playing the Rolling Stones on Radio 1. And he would expect people to laugh and play along, because they did a lot of that sort of, you know, dicking about on the set of the first Star Wars. But he was the only actor on set. So it was just him (laughs) and a crew who'd spent hours positioning the puppet, getting Frank Oz under the floor, giving him the earpiece, and for Mark to, (laughs) uh, to, to, to ruin the take that way. 
they weren't impressed. <laughs> That's and he brilliant. was pulled aside. I love Appar- Mark Havel. I know, me too. But apparently, they pulled Mark aside and were just like, "Yeah, if you if that happens again, just don't just work through it." <laughs> <laughs> I feel for him because he talks about in the in Empire of Dream as like being the only cast member on the call sheet for weeks of shooting <laughs> because everything have else you, was uh, props. <laughs> have you seen the, the YouTube <laughs> compilation? That's like. All the, like, 50 times Mark Hamill tried to warn the fans about The Last Jedi. And it's just loads of pre-interviews before the film came out of Mark Hamill being like, um... <laughs> Yeah. It was, clear that, it was clear that he, like some of the people who disagreed with that film, didn't like the choices made for Luke. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. definitely. But it's, uh, it's, it's, great. it's great watching if, uh, if people haven't seen it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um... So, uh, oh, with the exception of being sucked out of a Cloud City window, Mark Hamill did all of his own stunts in this movie. Um, and I tell you what, oh, uh, not to, not to, you know, not to take this down a weird path, Chris, but I tell you what, he's in good shape in this film, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. He's good, in, yeah. That, in that, in that, in that, in that, in that um, vest on Hoth, I was like, bloody hell, Mark Hamill worked out from the last movie. Like he clearly was like, oh, I'm yeah. a hero now. I need to get in shape. So credit to yeah. him. He looks he looks very very good in these in this movie. He's basically a super a superhero in the next one. So <laughs> yeah, it's pretty incredible. So yeah, credit to to, to Mark. Um, Carrie Fisher was stood on a box for a lot of her scenes with Han Solo because uh, there's a big height difference. Um, she's five foot one and he's uh, six foot. So there is a foot difference basically between the two. So to give them some level playing field, they put her on a box. Um, you don't actually notice, which is interesting. Fair play. Um, apparently, whenever Mark Hamill was feeling a little bit low and having trouble with the, the Dagobah scenes, because they were apparently quite grueling to film, uh, Frank Oz had snuck in Miss Piggy um, <laughs> and used her and had used her to make Mark Hamill laugh several times. That's amazing. I oh, wish there was footage what? of that. I looked. I couldn't find. If anyone knows where the footage of that is, if there's footage of that anywhere, please, please, please send it to me. I would love to see, see that. The amount of stone cold legends involved in Star Wars. Yeah, it's Chris. I, yeah, I love so many of these people. I agree with you. Yes. Um, so uh, during principal photography, it remained unclear if Alec Guinness would actually return as Obi Wan Kenobi. Um, he had an eye operation at the time. Um, uh, sorry, he just had an eye operation at the time. He did finally agree and worked just one day of the movie uh, for the, on the movie. It was Wednesday. September the 5th, 1979, he arrived at 8.30 and had completed his scenes by one in which he was paid a quarter of a percentage point of the film, film's gross, which was worth millions of dollars, and he was never seen again. No, I mean, obviously, he comes out that stuff, but I think that's so funny that he did half a day on this movie. <laughs> that's nuts. Um, George Lucas had originally offered Jim Henson um, a friend of his the role of Yoda but Henson had turned it down because he was busy making the great Muppet caper at the time and had recommended Frank Oz um, for the role instead Lucas was so impressed with Oz as Yoda he spent thousands of dollars oh we've already talked about this that's in twice sorry that would have been smoother for me to put it in there, but apparently it was also earlier in the trivia. Um, <laughs> for the 2004 DVD release, the scene with Darth Vader and the Empire and the Emperor and the Emperor and the Emperor was altered to reintroduce Ian McDermott uh, playing the Emperor as he does in, you know, Return of the Jedi. Um, and uh, so, in the original version, it had been played by an actress called Marjorie Eaton. Uh, who actually got was was never credited even at the time, and then they'd superimposed a chimpanzee's eyes over that image of her, and then um, given gave it a you know gave the emperor a voice by a guy called Clive Revel. Um, the dialogue was oh, also wow. adjusted when the scene was re-recorded by Ian McDermott and James L. Jones. Um, now it's interesting because a lot of these changes came in two thousand sorry in nineteen ninety seven right like the hand shot first which we'll come back to, annoyingly, this time. I've got a, 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 more, some more myth-busting going on there. Um, you know, uh, you know the, the, the singing scene at the opening of the next one, all the extra CGI we talked about in the last one, you know, when, the, when, they, when they visit Mos Eisley and stuff. Um, this movie, um, this change, I should say, for this movie, was only introduced in the DVD release in 2004, like six, seven years later. So the version I grew up with was you know, this half lady, half chimpanzee <laughs> creature. Yeah, yeah, and I do completely. remember as a kid going, why does it not look like the emperor in the next movie? 
I don't think I got it. I don't think I got that they were meant to be the same person. <laughs> really? Yeah, possible. Yeah, it makes it makes sense to me. Yeah, you're right. It is it it is nuts with all they changed in 1997 and mm-hmm. that they didn't change that until yeah until later until 2004 until later. Like surely yeah. that because that that one like you know it it makes sense. It's a sh- it's a shame for all those involved in the original scene, but mm-hmm. you know considering. He then played him in the sequels. It makes well, yes. sense as a change. It is. It, 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 sorry, not it, in Return the specifically. The fact no Return Return of the Jedi specifically. The fact that he plays him oh, in the very yes. next film means that it makes sense that that was changed in nineteen ninety seven. Like, yeah, it, bizarre. Yet, to they me. didn't. Yeah, it's it's bizarre to me as well. And I think it's also like it's interesting that so the two thousand four DVD release brought around another very famous change, which we'll come to next week, which is Hayden Christensen being added to the because obviously he hadn't even been he was a child. He hadn't been cast and wasn't involved in the prequels yeah. when the nineteen ninety seven reworking happened. Um but it is interesting that two of the bigger changes from the two thousand four release are casting. Mm. to create consistency now we talked a little bit last week about like oh you know where's the line what's okay what's not okay i'm okay with this one if i'm being honest with you um i the original scene is fine and works but it is an inconsistency and it does you know looking at it now like if i had seen that scene as it was in this version of the movie i'd have been you know it, it creates a weird dissonance between this and the next movie this is a change I'm not particularly offended by. Uh, it creates no, consistency I... across the franchise. Um, it, it's, it doesn't make it worse. Um, the dialogue is changed, but the thrust of the conversation is mostly the same. Yeah, this I think it's those, a little... Sh- this is one of those ones sh- I don't mind. It's a shame to lose the he's a boy thing. Um, I think that's quite fatherly and, and quite yes. gives Darth Vader a bit of an arc. Um, but as we will talk about next week, I find it way less offensive and insane than the mm-hmm. Hayden Christensen being mm-hmm. inserted into yes. Return of the Jedi, which we will talk about <laughs> yes. next week. So, two bits of myth busting. First of all, one from last week that I'm sure we may have got tons of comments about. I gave out the one last week that I read. So what happened was, last week I did, it was so much trivia to go through. I spent, honestly, last week I lost hours of my Friday prepping for our podcast on the Saturday to make sure the trivia was on. And one thing that stuck out to me was the trivia about the Greedo shooting first thing being related to a change for the MPAA for for ratings. Because basically, PG-13 as a rating had been invented between original Star Wars release and 1997 re-release. And when you re-release a movie with any changes, the movie has to be re-rated. So it made sense to me that that was the reason. Hmm. But there was a niggly thing in the back of my head, even at the time, and I went, I'm sure I've heard Lucas talk about this and explain why he thinks it's better Greedo shoots first. And then, so I quickly Googled it, and on the surface, that checked out. I did a bit, just a tiny bit of, like, surface-level research, and a few people were, there were a few different sources telling the changing for the rating thing. So I dismissed my concerns, and I cracked on, and we did the podcast, and I very boldly proclaimed that. Having looked further into it, Chris, it does not appear to be the case. At no point has Lucas ever talked about this being relating to ratings. It is pure speculation. um, And also doesn't even really fit with the MPAA's guidelines on what would change a rating of a movie. Hand shooting first wouldn't really fit what they say it's that's not a, an offending idea. You know what I mean? Like the hero having to take action, pre- premature sort of action in terms of violence and stuff, not really on their necessarily their list of reasons they might give you a higher rating. So it doesn't really track. So that doesn't appear to be true. So for those of you who've bombarded, I'm sure bombarded us with comments about that. There's my correction. Um, to continue the myth busting, a long held piece of trivia for this movie that even I remember you know, repeating in the schoolyard in my younger days, um, was that this movie, one of the asteroids, was a shoe. <laughs> that, they'd, that, that basically the story goes that Lucas had told them to fix 
and changed the asteroid scene so many times he was not happy with the special effects and he kept asking them to redo it that out of annoyance they snuck a shoe in. And also a potato, goes the rumour. And I believed that for many years. And I had a look into it when I saw the trivia listed this week. And I found a website that had kind of busted it a little bit by using some like HD imagery and stuff to like zoom in. And what it actually is, and the reason it stands out, it is, is an asteroid, but it's one that has not been properly composited into the shot. And it's not been properly color corrected. So it stands right. out amongst the other asteroids, and it does have the vague shape of a. I think like a. I think they said it was like a. It looked like a Nike sneaker from the time, or something like that. I don't know, maybe like a yeah, like a Nike tennis shoe. I think they said from that era. Um, but no, it was it was simply a, a bad piece of compositing that no one caught, um, and that and so it stood out and looked weird, and in subsequent versions of the story people would always say oh and then they removed it they didn't remove it they fixed the compositing <laughs> so years later they went back and made the color match so it doesn't stand out like a sore thumb anymore which is why it, yeah. it quote unquote vanishes so yeah a little bit more uh trivia myth busting nice so nice um, I, so like, got a, I like that i like that I guess, as a as a, as a, mm. as a segment Mm. Um, so there's some. There's still more. Sorry, we'll, I'll get through these ones as fast as I can. Um, in an interview with Cinemascope magazine, Irvin Kirshner is said to have uh, said he had no interest in movies with special effects. He had been won over, however, by George Lucas um, when he talked to him about the movie and, and, and focus on characterization. Um, and that was Kirshner's interest. You know, he didn't really care too much about the hardware and the you know the, the special effects. Um, and Kirshner had actually spent a few weeks working or several months, it says here, working on the script with. Lucas and um, uh, Lawrence Kasdan uh, before, you know, sort of pushing to humanise the characters a bit more. Um, something that Lucas has often been failed, uh, sort of criticised for failing to do. Um, mm. He decided for that this movie, the members of the Rebel Alliance would speak in American accents, while Imperial officers would speak in British accents to make the story a bit more of an analogy for the American Revolution. However, many of the supporting actors that appeared as rebel personnel on Hoth were in fact British actors because that is where it was shot. So consequently, Kirshner had to redub several scenes with American voices in post-production. <laughs> so, <laughs> there you go. And that is an idea that was never kept up in any other movie. So, you know, no. good effort, but sorry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> also, I don't need it to be analogous to the real-life Civil War. It's kind of a... No. Weird, pointless thing to do. Um, the blizzard scene in the hot scenes is a completely real blizzard. No special effects used at all. Um, Harrison Ford actually couldn't initially arrive at the filming location via any sort of regular transport route, and they had to bring him in uh, on a snowplow <laughs> because the weather was so bad. Um, and now I have a special section, Chris. A special section of the trivia called the What's the real source of the sound relating to Darth Vader? It's got a catchy okay. title. <laughs> so it's good. Yeah, smooth. Th three pieces of trivia relating to the, what the sounds of Darth Vader's various things actually are. So his helmet being lowered onto his body was apparently the sound of somebody putting their hand over a, 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 a Hoover, a vacuum tube, while it was still sucking in dust. Nice, <laughs> very nice. <laughs> the sound of Darth Vader's meditation chamber um, opening is reportedly a recording of the whole block of Alcatraz cell doors slamming shut. Seems like a lot of effort to go to, but there you go. Yeah, I was going to say that's quite a that's quite I, a, a lot of yeah. I assume that sound was in a library somewhere. I can't imagine they sent uh, someone out. Yeah, good point. I, I, like, Dad, we need a sound for this meditation chamber opening. Anybody fancy a visit to Alcatraz? <laughs> Yeah, um, so point. yeah, I've got to assume. I so I hope. I don't know, but I hope that was a that was a sound they already had. Um, the sound of Darth Vader's meditation chamber was the sound of a generator at an air force base that the crew visited. Hmm. Nice. So there you go. That's where the sounds of Darth Vader's things come from. Thank you for coming to my TED talk. Right, <laughs> let's, let's carry yeah. on. So much of this. Having Han Solo frozen in carbonite was at least in part due to the fact that they were not sure uh, Harrison Ford would return for the third movie uh, when A New Hope was made. Carrie Fisher and Mark Hamill signed on um, for a full three-movie deal, but Harrison Ford had refused. Uh, Ford even requested George Lucas kill off Solo since the character had played his part already. Lucas refused, saying that he still had a heroic part for Han to play in Return of the Jedi, um, which was a lie. <laughs> I've seen that movie. That's a lie. Yeah. I was going to say, that, that doesn't happen. 
Yeah. Uh, Boba Fett is never actually referred to by name in the movie. He's just referred to as the bounty hunter um, the character uh, by, by the characters. However, a deleted scene included on the Blu-ray set shows Leia um, tending to Luke's wound, saying a bounty hunter named Boba Fett has taken Han Solo. So he was named in the original script. It just didn't work its way into the movie. And presumably his name then got out through the, you know, toys and external media. Um Harrison Solo's Harrison Solo's use of oh god my this is where it's starting to, this I was just thinking I was literally just thinking a second ago this is actually going all right considering how unwell I am and how little sleep I've had I think this is a, I think we've I think we've we've powered through this Chris and then I I re- referred to it as Harrison Solo uh, so it all fell apart very quickly um, turns out we use, were meant to be reviewing Return of the Jedi yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thank God we're not immediately reviewing anything else after this. Thank God this is I can finish this and go to sleep. Um, Han Solo's use of the mount's entrails to keep Luke warm is actually an uh, American Indian trick. According to legend, a hunter named Hugh Glass had killed a bear despite being mauled severely in the American frontier. He was abandoned by his fellow frontiermen and had crawled and had to crawl hundreds of miles to safety. On his way, he became trapped by a sudden blizzard, and he cut open. Um, a horse's stomach and had climbed inside and to stay warm and safe until the storm had subsided this event was actually dramatized in the movie uh the revenant in 2015 but well, that's kind of what yeah. it was based on so yeah, wow. um only five people knew about the darth vader twist prior to release which is we'll come back to Crazy. that because yeah a slight adjustment to that but the five people are george lucas who came up with the idea during his second draft director Irvin kershner um, who worked out worked on the script with George? Same with Lawrence Kasdan, worked on the script with George. Mark Hamill, who had been informed very, very shortly before filming the scene, like they pulled him aside and said, "Right, you're about to film this scene. He's going to say this. It's not the real line. Um, you react to this line." Um, and they gave him the real line, which is, "I am your father." Um, the original line they they had um, uh, David Prowse read was, "Obi Wan killed your father." Mm. Um, Which is also then, a good twist. And, then, and David Prowse must have thought that's an overreaction from Mark Hamill. Oh, maybe I'll try to tone it down between <laughs> takes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then James Earl Jones, who was obviously told during the recording sessions for the final dub. Yeah. But he then went on to say that Darth Vader, he thought his interpretation was that Darth Vader was lying about that. Um, Dave Prowse, also, by the way, very annoyed about being kept out of the loop. Another movie that pissed off David Prowse. <laughs> Poor David Prowse. Um, he basically sort of was frustrated because he felt he would have performed the movements completely differently if he'd have known the true line. Yeah, that's fairish, I guess. Mm, yeah, that's probably fair. Um, the script line in the script, obviously, as I mentioned, was Obi Wan killed your father, knowing it would be dubbed over at a later time. Uh, Mark Campbell was all just before the scene. Um, <laughs> so when at the premiere. And the line was spoken, and the truth was revealed. The crowd gasped, I assume, in shock. Harrison Ford, apparently, who was sat next to Mark Hamill at the premiere, turned to him and whispered, Hey, kid, you never fucking told me that. <laughs> <laughs> and was quite unhappy about it. But that's Still- all kind of ironic, considering what they also did. So back in the day, it was very common practice to release a novelization of a movie, right? So the movie would come out, and a book would come out, that basically retold the story of the movie with, with in prose rather than in script form. Yeah. Uh, the movie's novelis- novelization was published a month before release, and they didn't even attempt to cover up the Darth Vader being Luke's father thing. It's just in there. Oh Jesus! So the so the idea that anyone was shocked, <laughs> I guess I guess in a pre-internet world, unless you yeah. bought that book or knew someone who had that book, I guess you just don't know going in. But that's crazy to me. <laughs> Especially because there must have been huge Star Wars fans by that point going out and seeking anything they could, including yeah. the book. Correct. Yeah. Imagine it's releasing still... a book of a film a month before it came out. <laughs> it's still one of my favourite Simpsons Simpsons gags when they do yes. a flashback episode and as Homer's walking out of the cinema, he says, I couldn't believe that Darth Vader was Luke's father and a whole queue of people just go, oh. <laughs> Can I tell you, I had a real life version of that. For Star Wars, oh. I was in the queue in at the for the IMAX for Force Awakens. Um, it was my third viewing. <laughs> this was like a daytime viewing on a Saturday uh, with some friends, and we were in the queue. And the 
they'd lined us up outside the IMAX and they were bringing out the previous crowd and this little girl yells, and spoilers for Force Awakens if you haven't seen it, but this little girl yells, I can't believe they killed Han Solo! <laughs> now, I'd seen it twice and found this funny. <laughs> yeah. But I can tell you now, on the first, it was like Saturday or Sunday afternoon after the film had released, that crowd was not happy. But what was even funnier was they couldn't say or do anything because it was a small child and what can you do, right? Well, unlike unlike someone I know on my Facebook who because the movie came out on like what the 22nd or something of December, um mm-hmm. someone I know got drunk on Christmas Day and simply put as their Facebook status Han Solo dies. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he he was called names in the comments. <laughs> I'll bet. Well, yeah, an adult is responsible for their choices. <laughs> it's hard to be annoyed at a child for being excited it, uh, about the movie they just watched. Um, I did but... it. I did it. With, I did it with Harry Potter because a mate was annoying me. So to be an absolute dickhead, he was reading the fourth book, and I just went. Have you got to the bit where Cedric dies? And he was clearly on like chapter five. I, <laughs> out, out and out, it's dickhead. Like it's, I'm completely it's, in the wrong. Yeah. It's, it isn't it funny that the Harry Potter has such a history of that. I remember when the um sixth book leaked the snape uh, spoilers harry potter snape kills dumbledore those three words people bought t-shirts with that on and wore them around because the book had leaked about a, a week or two early and people were putting it on billboards it was like a real weird Riffing. ruin everyone's fun campaign with that one i don't I, yeah i found that really there odd. were a lot of there were a lot of fake spoilers for the last one cuz i remember I remember a really cocky mate being like, "I know what happens. I know what happens. I know what happens." And what they what they had heard happened was that Ron dies, and uh, I don't I don't give a shit about spoilers. So I I flicked to the last page, saw Ron's name, and just held the book up in front of him, and I was like, "What What do you know?" And he was like, mm, "Oh, oh, because <laughs> <laughs> it partly, but it partly because he annoyed me because he'd gone." Like, they weren't buying it at midnight. They'd just gone to laugh at all the people that were, including mates of his. <laughs> like, so. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Right, last couple pieces of trivia. I'm so sorry this has gone so long, but we've got the last, the last three or four now, very quickly. Uh, one of the very first ideas for Lando Calrissian was to have him as a clone who'd survived the Clone Wars that had been referenced in the previous movie. Um, and th- he'd led, like, it wasn't like a mining colony, but it was a planet full of clones of him that, that, that they'd settled um, another early idea was to have lando as a descendant um of survivors of the clone wars born into a family who'd re- reproduced solely by cloning um and originally his name was in that draft was lando kadar um staying on the subject of uh lando um an early draft also had Luke's reason for not leaving Lando and Chewie at the end of the movie was that his Jedi training was more important. But they thought that actually kind of undercut the, what Luke learned in the movie and that it made him seem less sympathetic. So Irvin Kirshner had it changed to where Luke was still recovering from his injuries and that rescuing Han would be his first priority once mm. recovered. Um, nice. Yeah. Um, Billy D. Williams has also said that at the time, whenever he went to pick up his daughter from elementary school, children would start arguments with him, accusing him of portraying Han Solo. (laughs) It's my favourite. I love that so much. Um, And then the very final piece of trivia obviously just relates to, for those who may have noticed, um, if you're thinking, God, isn't it crazy that that (laughs) that the voices are so close? Boba Fett's lines sound just like the guy who plays Jango Fett in Attack of the Clones... In th- the movie released in 2002 well congratulations you just watched the Star Wars version from the 2004 DVDs where another small casting change was that they changed Han- uh, Boba Fett's voice to match the clone actor that he should theoretically sound like so they brought in uh, Tamara Morrison who played Jango Fett in Star Wars Episode 2 Attack of the Clones so the guy who got to play Boba Fett in the recent Mandalorian series that's his voice <laughs> So there you go. Which is cool, but yeah, I can see that that one I think is like harmless it being another voice like yeah. that's that's fine. Like yeah, they're, they're, I don't think it's yeah. There there it's are a handful of trivia that I just think like uh, it's a trivia. There are a handful of like changes that I'm just like uh, that that makes no difference to me personally. Yeah. Yeah, and I'd go with that one. Um, creates, cool, creates more right, consistency. For the, for the sake of time then Dan, I'm going to I'm going to unless you've got one, have you got a listener question? 
I do, but we can skip it. Okay. If you, if, no, go on. No, wanna... do, do the listener question. You sure? You don't. Yeah, you, yeah. What were you, you going to do in the sake of time? Just make up one. No, I was going to go. I'm. I'll, I'll. I'll take the listener question, and the question will be: What are we watching next week, Dan? <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um. Uh. Oh, one second. There you go, Chris. The question is, and it's a good one, and this comes from Latty. If you could wipe your memory to reconsume one piece of media, in quote marks, for the first time, what would you use that on? Mm. Mm. Isn't that tough? Mm. Have you got an answer? I, I, part of me thinks it, I would choose something lengthy. So maybe uh, well, the problem is, is it one? Is it well? I suppose we have to define the rules because if it was, if I could use, if I could use it on a like a franchise, it'd be the Harry Potter books because the idea of being able to reread the Harry Potter books for the first time. Mm. Then again, the magic might be gone, Chris. Uh, Turns yeah, out J.K. JK go... Rowling's a big old transphobe and stuff. I'm going to go with something incredibly obvious for me, but I am mm. going to go with the Office, the U.S. Office, because. Right. I don't want to go for Star Wars, Back to the Future, Doctor Who. I don't want to go for yes. anything where it's so tied to me watching it as a kid and the magic of that. I want to go for something that I know I would adore mm-hmm. as an adult right here, right now. Yeah. And that would be The Office. Yeah. So, obvious answer from me. I apologize for that. But I, it is the right answer to that question for me personally. Yeah, that is a good one. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm still going to go with that. If I can do, if if you're doing the entire of the office, I, I can do the, I can do the Harry Potter books, can't I? No, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I thought your, I thought your debate on Harry Potter was more, you know, whether it would, it would it have counted. the same effect. Because I, I would potentially choose Harry Potter. Now, see, the office is longer. I'd get more from the office. I, yeah, I'd go for the office. Mm, solid choice. Good logic. There you go. So, yeah, th- um, you go. thank you for the question. If you'd like to ask a question of us to answer at the end of a podcast, head over to the Patreon for as little as $1 a month. You can get episodes a week early. So if you want to hear us talk about The Last Jedi and you're, li- and you're listening to this on Spotify or iTunes, The Last Jedi episode of this podcast is available right now. We haven't recorded it yet. And thank God we're not recording it immediately. Um, but that is, a- that is available as we speak to you right now. That's Switch quite- this off. Go listen to that. That's quite a bold choice. What? You, what are you? How come you don't want to complete the trilogy? Oh, sorry, did I say the Last Jedi? Fuck it up. Yeah. I'm so ill. God damn my brain today. Like, I mean, I, I didn't need to be a I, dick I am about really it, proud that did, I held yeah. it together for this podcast because I I can I cannot express to you in words what a mess I was this morning to the point when I, there was a moment I nearly texted you and said we can't do this today, uh, and then I thought no, Chris will have rearranged work stuff. I'll power through. I'll like Jeez, you something. didn't even know I'd got up at 5 a.m. to watch it yet, did you? <laughs> no, I hadn't. No, no, I didn't know that at that point. So, but so yeah, I, I yeah. Um, so anyway, but yeah. Sorry, Re- 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 Return of the Jedi, Jedi. Revenge of well, the Dad Jedi. Dad and I, you can catch us in all the usual places. I'm gonna put Dad out of his mis- misery. Catch us in all the usual places. You check out patreon.com forward slash nothing but static for next week's episode, which is mm-hmm. the Return on the Jedi. Just to ret- just to confirm, Dan, you are choosing Return of the Jedi. I take Return it? of the Jedi, not Last Jedi. Sweet. Um, yep. And yeah, Twitter, nothing but static. YouTube, nothing but static. Facebook, all the places, all the places. Email, nothing yeah, you, but static you, you, at gmail.com. Um, yes, oh, well, nothing but static without the G at gmail.com or without the G. mail at nothing but static at uh, uk. Also, uh, Twitter at Dan Doolan and at C Billingham, two M's, and it's patreon.com slash nothing but static if you want to get us there. And also, I just last night added a new feature that I, they've put it right. They put a feature in place and didn't tell me where I can create an RSS feed for our patrons. So you can oh, now cool. add the early episodes to your podcast app of choice. So you don't oh, have to cool. go you that's don't have wicked. to go into the Patreon and individually download the bonus or new episodes as we put them up early. There's just a podcast feed where you can just stream them like a normal podcast. Uh, but and it oh, is everything. Awesome. So it will switch. It's gonna be a weird feed because it's gonna have analyzing avatar in it and then um, rewind reviews and then randomly things like nothing but claps. Basically, anything audio I put on the Patreon goes into this feed, um, and that's really cool. You, will, if you're already a patron um, of us, like back on the 
18th of March when I put it in place. You'll have had an email about it. So check through your email if that's still there. Um, if not, yeah, if you if you go into either the Patreon app or the website, you can you can get the RSS feed link there, or you can add it manually to any uh, podcasting app you have. But you have to then put your Patreon username and password in, or it won't connect it because it'll it, it obviously it's. It, you have to be a patron to be able to get access to that content. Um, but yeah, I'm really pleased they have that feature. I'm a little annoyed they added it without telling me, though, because God knows how long mm. we've been we've had availability. We could have been able to switch that on months ago, for all I know. I'm, I'm a little yeah, annoyed. Yeah, but it's there now, at least. So. Yeah, we've got it. Someone pointed out, I think it was actually, fully enough, I think it was Latty who gave us today's question, who'd said, hey, have you looked into this RSS feed thing? That would be really useful. And I thanked him. I was like, thank you so much for showing me that. And he was like, yeah, it was self-interest, to be honest. <laughs> like, I, I, w- I would like an RSS feed. <laughs> no, but it's, it's, a great, it's a great feature for all, so. Yes, yes. yeah, it really right. helps. So we will see you next week for Return of the Jedi. I'm Chris Billingham. I'm Dan Dillon. And this review has been the round. Get some of that next week. We get some of that Last Jedi action in for some weird reason. <laughs> Skip two movies. Fuck Skip me. two. Go straight to Last Jedi. <laughs>